Strike Them a Blow. Battle Along the North Anna River. May 21st through the 25th, 1864. By Chris Mikowski. Published by Savas Beatty. And read for you by the author. All rights reserved. The Emerging Civil War series offers compelling and easy-to-understand overviews of some of the Civil War's most important battles, stories, places, and personalities. Each print book in the series features dozens of photos and graphics, original maps, and visually engaging layouts. They're also useful as battlefield guides for anyone who wants to carry them out onto the field. The Emerging Civil War series is published by Savis Beatty in partnership with Emerging Civil War, a consortium of more than two dozen historians dedicated to connecting the public with America's defining event. Visit us online at www.emergingcivilwar.com. Chris Mikowski, co-founder and series editor. For My Father Touring the Battlefield This book covers events that begin at Spotsylvania Courthouse and spill down to the banks of the North Anna River. The easiest way to get to North Anna from Spotsylvania is to follow modern Route 1, Jefferson Davis Highway, from Massaponics Church southward 18.8 miles to Mount Carmel Church. Route 1 follows the route of the old Telegraph Road, which the armies used in 1864. However, the emerging Civil War series book, No Turning Back, a guide to the 1864 Overland Campaign, by Robert M. Dunkerley, Donald C. Fons, and Dave Ruth, provides an excellent driving tour that follows the Federal Second Corps from Spotsylvania, past Massaponics Church and Guinea Station, down to Bowling Green and Milford Station, and finally to Mount Carmel Church. Parts of the Ninth Corps' march overlaps that route, too. The tour is filled with information about some of the sites along the way, such as the Tyler House and Bethel Church, and includes additional accounts from the march. Of the 16,506.26 acres of North Anna Battlefield that fall in the hypothetical boundary established by the National Register and the National Park Service, fewer than 100 acres had been preserved prior to 2014. In that year, the Civil War Trust added another 665 acres. Portions of the landscape have been altered, the NPS reported, but most essential features remain, Although the commercial and industrial development along Route 30 has begun to impact the southern portion of the battlefield, much of the historic landscape can still be preserved. Because much of the existing battlefield remains in private hands, please respect the rights of property owners as you explore the area. A final note. Because the actions along the North Anna happened on multiple fronts along both banks of the river, the geography does not lend itself to a chronological exploration of the battle. Therefore, sites of interest are labeled here in roughly chronological order, without driving directions between them. Relevant information about each location can be found in the respective chapters. Forward by Gordon C. Ray The Overland Campaign of 1864 ranks among the American Civil War's pivotal campaigns. It also numbers among the most exciting, pitting the war's two premier generals, Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee, against one another for the first time. In his battles against Lee, Grant demonstrated firm commitment to an unwavering strategic objective, the destruction of Lee's army, in the face of tactical setbacks in the wilderness, at Spotsylvania Courthouse, at the North Anna River, and at Cold Harbor. Often depicted as a butcher enamored of hopeless charges against invulnerable Confederate earthworks, Grant, in fact, employed thoughtful combinations of maneuver and force to bring a difficult adversary to bay. Lee, famous for his ability to outgeneral opponents wielding manpower advantages similar to Grant's, demonstrated exceptional skill and daring that served to thwart Grant's offenses. Lee made mistakes that seriously imperiled his army, the Battle of the Bloody Angle at Spotsylvania Courthouse comes to mind, but his uncanny knack for improvising solutions always redeemed the day. Grant and Lee each favored offensive operations and were masters at improvisation. In many respects, they were as evenly matched in military talent as any two opposing generals have ever been. The subject of this book, the movement to the North Anna River and the stirring events that took place there, is the least known of Grant's and Lee's confrontations. In many respects, however, it is the most interesting. 
The operation began with a cat-and-mouse game of maneuvers from Spotsylvania Courthouse to the North Anna River. Lee assumed a strong line below the river, protecting Richmond and its critical rail line with the Shenandoah Valley. But part of the Union Army pushed across the North Anna at Jericho Ford, and Lee's subordinate, Ambrose Powell Hill, failed to drive the Federals back. With his defensive river line breached and a northern host massing on his flank, Lee faced his gravest challenge yet. His response, a clever defensive formation with intriguing offensive possibilities, stands as a monument to the Confederate commander's ingenuity and ability to turn a bad situation his way. Chris Mikowski's Strike Them a Blow is an absorbing, fast-paced exposition of this astounding campaign. In the years following the war, the Confederate cartographer Jedediah Hotchkiss tried to understand the North Anna operations, but found himself wandering about in the entanglement of conflicting statements, at times well-nigh lost and inclined to wash my hands of the whole matter. But I am in for it and cannot escape. We're fortunate that Mr. Mikowski has tried his hand at entangling the web of accounts surrounding these events, and that he, too, stayed in for it. His highly readable book gives us an exemplary roadmap to this neglected slice of American history. If I can get one more pull at Grant, I will defeat him. Robert E. Lee Everything looks exceedingly favorable to us. Ulysses S. Grant Prologue, May 24th, 1864 We must strike them a blow, Lee said. We must strike them a blow. The old gray fox had once more demonstrated his cleverness. He and his commanders had laid a perfect trap for the Army of the Potomac, and the Federals had stumbled right into it. Now it was time to spring it. Now it was time to strike them a blow. But lying on his cot, confined to his tent, racked by dysentery, Robert E. Lee, the commanding general of the Army of Northern Virginia, was in no condition to strike anything. Three weeks of incessant fighting, constant movement, and non-stop worry had left Lee physically and mentally exhausted, made exponentially worse by a chronic lack of sleep. The May rain, seven days of it since the month began twenty-four days earlier, had seeped into everyone's bones, and bedrolls, and uniforms, and shoes, for those who had them. Lee had been more protected from it than most, but dampness like that has a way of settling in. Lee's staff had seen it coming, had seen him dragging, had felt the sting of his growing irritability, but Lee tried to push through nonetheless. The Federals had been at him and his army constantly since May 5th, and were still not giving him any chance to catch his breath. The grueling toll of the campaign now lay over Lee like a shroud. It had gotten so bad that for the past two days he had given up his fine gray mare, Traveler, and had taken to riding in a carriage. Now he could not even muster the strength for that. He dared not venture far from his headquarters tent, unsure when the next bout would grip him. The fever, chills, the sweats, the stomach upset that drained him, sapped his strength, and left him dehydrated. Lee was at his most vulnerable. And without his leadership, the army was too. The month of May had been hard on the Confederate army. Lee had lost his dependable old war horse, First Corps Commander Lieutenant General James Longstreet, 18 days earlier. Longstreet's replacement, Richard Anderson, had proven a capable substitute in the time since, but was still getting his legs under him. Second Corps Commander Lieutenant General Richard Ewell, Lee's second in command now due to seniority, showed signs of the same ailment now crippling Lee. But something far worse crippled Ewell, too. The once capable fighter had fallen from Lee's favor these past few days, ever since losing his cool during the federal breakthrough at Spotsylvania on May 12th. Days after that, on May 19th, Ewell nearly lost his entire corps in a fight on the rolling hills of the Harris Farm. He saved his corps, but he lost Lee's confidence. Third Corps Commander Lieutenant General A.P. Hill, just returning from illness of a different sort, had performed poorly just the previous day, adding to his already lackluster resume as a Corps Commander. 
and so sat perhaps even lower than Yule in Lee's esteem. With no one to turn to, Lee tried to direct the battle on his own, from his cot in his tent. We must strike them a blow, he pleaded, more than order, fever-weakened as he was. We must strike them a blow. Chapter 1 The Campaign May 1864 The sun went down red, noted Surgeon William Morton, as he surveyed the blighted landscape around Spotsylvania Courthouse. The smoke of the battle of more than 200,000 men, destroying each other with villainous saltpeter through all the long hours of a long day, filled the valleys and rested on the hills of all this wilderness, hung in lurid haze all around the horizon, and built a dense canopy overhead, beneath which this grand army of freedom was preparing to rest against the morrow. It was May 18th, 1864. That morning, Federal Commander Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant had ordered another massive assault against Confederate fortifications. Unbeknownst to him, though, they were the strongest field fortifications yet seen in the Eastern Theater. His attack ended in disaster. Our lines advanced splendidly to within 300 yards of their works when they opened their artillery and mowed the men down in rows, said Rhode Islander Elijah Hunt Rhodes. We stood it for two hours and then fell back to our own works where we had fortified. Our loss is fearful. When the smoke of battle cleared away, it disclosed the ground for long distances thickly strewn with our dead and dying men, said Engineer Wesley Brainerd. It was an awfully grand spectacle, one often repeated around that ground, which has been justly styled Bloody Spotsylvania. Such scenes had revealed themselves all too frequently since the start of the spring campaign. Major General George Gordon Meade, commander of the Army of the Potomac, had marched south across the Rapidan River on May 4th to confront his Confederate counterparts for another season of battle. Traveling with him was Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant, commander of all Union forces. "'Lee's army will be your objective,' he told Meade. "'Wherever Lee goes, there you will go also.'" This represented a major strategic shift for the North, which had always sought to end the war by capturing the Confederate capital. On to Richmond had always been the battle cry. No more. Grant intended to hammer continuously against the armed force of the enemy and his resources until by mere attrition, if in no other way, there should be nothing left to him. Historically, this has always been interpreted as Grant's war of attrition. But in fact, Grant didn't have unlimited time to slowly wear away the Confederates. The presidential election in November imposed an unforgiving deadline. If Grant did not somehow come up with the big win that had thus far eluded the Federal Army in the East, Lincoln's prospects for re-election looked bleak. It was, therefore, a war of annihilation Grant intended to wage, one that would overwhelm the Confederates with superior might. Regardless of the terminology, it represented grim arithmetic, to be sure. But Grant proved to be the exact kind of mathematician President Lincoln had been looking for, and exactly what the Confederates feared. Time was their greatest ally. They, not Grant, were waging the war of attrition, dragging out the bloodshed until Election Day, wearing down the Northern will to continue. If we can break up the enemy's arrangements early and throw him back, predicted Lieutenant General James Longstreet, he will not be able to recover his position nor his morale until the presidential election's over and we shall then have a new president to treat with. Longstreet, first corps commander in the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army's second in command, knew what it meant to have Grant traveling with the Army of the Potomac. That man, he worried, will fight us every day and every hour till the end of the war. When the Army of the Potomac launched its spring offensive for 1864, it did so with the power of 123,000 soldiers, in comparison, the Confederates mustered some 66,000 men. Confederate Commander Robert E. Lee didn't know the exact disparity, but the Federals had always outnumbered his army, and he expected this spring to be no different. To counterbalance that mismatch, 
He launched a sudden strike against the Federals on May 5th as they tried to move through the wilderness, a 70-square-mile tangle of second-growth forest. This, viewed as a battleground, was simply infernal, a Union soldier later said. Grant's infantry could not fully deploy, his cavalry could not effectively maneuver, and his artillery had few clear targets. It's impossible to conceive a field worse adapted to the movements of a Grand Army, a Union officer lamented, which is exactly why Lee hit them there. For two days, the two armies drove each other through the forest in a desperate back-and-forth contest. The woods burned around them. Then, on May 7th, Grant did something no other federal commander had done before following a mauling at Lee's hands. Instead of withdrawing, he ordered the Army of the Potomac to maneuver past the Confederates. There will be no turning back, he had said the day before, and his men cheered wildly when they saw that he meant to keep his word. Grant ordered the army toward Spotsylvania Courthouse, where the ground was more open for a more conducive knockout battle. Village also provided the inside track to Richmond. Although Grant didn't care about the Confederate capital, he knew Lee had to defend it, so by moving on the city, Grant could force a confrontation. Lee's smaller army, quicker and more maneuverable, got the jump on Grant and beat him to the courthouse. More fighting ensued. Major assaults on May 8th, 10th, and 12th achieved varying degrees of success, but time and again, Lee staved off disaster. Grant, unperturbed, vowed to fight it out along this line if it takes all summer. In the midst of the grapple, the muggy weather broke. Rain, quagmire, misery. The whole country is a sea of mud, a federal artillerist wrote. One of Grant's aides lamented that the men can secure no proper shelter and no comfortable rest. On May 14, Grant tried to outmaneuver Lee once more by sliding to the left. Once more, Lee countered. The armies probed, shifted, fortified. The men forged onward, trudged, slogged. Tension mounted, exhaustion deepened, nerves frayed. It was a curious study to watch the effect which the constant exposure to fire had produced on the nervous systems of the troops, one federal officer observed. Their nerves had become so sensitive that the men would start at the slightest sound and dodge at the flight of a bird or the sight of a pebble tossed past them. Grant's tenacity and Lee's adaptability seemed the perfect match. For more than two weeks, the men had been in non-stop motion, marching, fighting, and maneuvering, virtually all of it while in close contact with the enemy. The days have been clear of late, not very warm, said a federal artillerist after the rain cleared on May 16th. But there's a heavy fog every night which keeps things in a state of chronic dampness and nastiness. We are all getting used to this wretched life now. I'm astonished to find how little sleep I can get along with when kept up by constant excitement. No one thought it could last, though. Least of all, Army of the Potomac Commander George Gordon Meade. It is hardly natural to expect men to maintain without limit the exhaustion of such a protracted struggle as we've been carrying on, he wrote his wife. Combined, the two armies had lost some 60,000 men since the opening of the campaign. If it required the loss of 20,000 to rob us of 6,000, Grant was doing a wise thing, for we yield our loss from an irreplaceable penury, he from superabundance, one Confederate noted ruefully. Ultimately, such bloody policy must win. Particularly hard on Lee were the steep losses he had taken among his division and brigade-level officers. Worst of all, Longstreet had been accidentally wounded by his own men while executing a flank attack through the wilderness on May 6th, an injury that would knock him out of action for six months. And Cavalry Commander James Ewell Brown Jeb Stewart had been mortally wounded at the Battle of Yellow Tavern on May 11th. We have found Grant a tough old customer, but we have no idea letting him whip us, wrote artillerist George Zirkel. It is reported that he's being rapidly reinforced, but we can kill him as fast as they come. With the bloody rebuff on May 18th, Grant arrived at the same conclusion. Every intelligent enlisted man in the Army of the Potomac knew that 
We could not wrestle the Confederate entrenchments at Spotsylvania from Lee's veteran infantry, a Union private announced. A New York Times correspondent put it more bluntly. The position could not be carried save by an expenditure of blood out of all proportion to the results of any possible victory that could be achieved there. As Grant had vowed earlier in the month, though, there would be no turning back. There was no time for repining, he said. My chief anxiety now is to draw Lee out of his works and fight him in the open field instead of assaulting him behind his entrenchments, Grant told his staff on May 20th. To that end, he had already begun drafting plans to once more bypass the Confederate Army. To some degree, he had to guess. Normally, cavalry would scout out possible routes, but Grant had sent his horsemen away on May 8th. Cavalry Commander Major General Philip Little Phil Sheridan led his men on a raid that culminated in the battle at Yellow Tavern, just outside Richmond, on May 11th, a move that led to Stuart's death, but which hamstrung Meade's army because it deprived it of its eyes and ears. Sheridan had yet to return, and Grant remained in the dark as to his cavalry chief's intentions. So Grant considered his options. He first looked to his right, Lee's left but a move in that direction would only take him toward the more thickly forested area around Gordonsville. With the thick forests of the wilderness fresh in his mind and the tangle of horrors that they had devolved into, Grant nixed that idea pretty quickly. A move to his left, on the other hand, Lee's right, would enable Grant to target the railroads around Hanover Junction just beyond the North Anna River. There, the Virginia Central Railroad from the Shenandoah Valley linked with the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad that ran north-south and supplied Lee's army. A move in that direction would also let Grant continue to take advantage of the new supply line he'd established through Fredericksburg. The Federal Navy could also bring him supplies up the area's many rivers. The danger was that Lee would read the move, shift his location, and dig in again to await another attack. Grant needed Lee to go on offense. However, as one of Grant's aides noted, in the battles of the last two weeks, Grant had thoroughly measured Lee's capacity as an opponent, and he believed it would be difficult to force him to take the offensive unless some good opportunity were offered. In order to entice Lee out of his works, Grant intended to send one of the four corps of his army, Major General Winfield Scott Hancock's second corps, on a wide flanking maneuver to the east and south toward the village of Bowling Green, some 20 miles away. Lee would catch wind of the movement Grant knew, and hopefully the isolated corps would prove too tempting a target for the Confederate commander to pass up. Lee would try and catch the second corps all alone and destroy it. But as soon as the Confederates moved, Grant planned to pounce on them. In preparation, Major General Governor K. Warren's 5th Corps was to get into position. Grant planned to send them down the Massaponnox Church Road to the Telegraph Road, and there march due south, securing the road for the rest of the army. The Union 6th and 9th Corps would put up a front for Lee at Spotsylvania, and then bring up the rear of the march. Even if Lee didn't take the 2nd Corps' bait, Grant still intended to be well positioned for a drive to the North Anna River and Hanover Junction beyond. Lee would have to react to the federal movement somehow, and with any luck, by coming out into the open where Grant could get at him. Not a man in the group I was with believed that the movement would be successful, one New York private said. But whether the movement would be successful or not, it was the only thing to be done unless it were to return to the camps north of the Rapidan. On May 19th, even as Grant had begun to evacuate all his wounded to Fredericksburg in advance of his departure from Spotsylvania, Lee sent 2nd Corps Commander Lieutenant General Richard Ewell on a wide flanking maneuver into Grant's rear. Simultaneously, Major General Jubal Early, temporarily in command of the Confederate 3rd Corps, launched an ineffectual assault in support from the main Confederate line. Federals nearly destroyed the 2nd Corps before darkness allowed Ewell's men to slip away to safety. Grant had originally planned to begin his withdrawal from Spotsylvania that night, but Ewell's raid delayed the departure, and gave him cause for optimism, too. The movement of Confederates yesterday gives me some hope that Lee may at times take the offensive, he said the next day, encouraged. 
and thus give our troops the desired opportunity. In this, however, the general was disappointed. Grant's aide Horace Porter later wrote, for the attack of the 19th was the last offensive movement in force that Lee ventured to make during the entire campaign. Lee seems to have determined to act altogether on the defensive of late, and Grant seems to be quite nonplussed as to what to do, artillerist Charles Wainwright wrote in his diary. Now that he has concluded to give up Spotsylvania altogether as a bad job, we have orders this evening to march in the morning. The race to the North Anna River was on and Lee did not yet know it had even begun. Chapter 2 Hancock's March, May 21st, 1864 After the carnage of the previous weeks, the nighttime march out of Spotsylvania must have seemed like a pleasant summer stroll for the men of Hancock's Second Corps. They had started the campaign by camping among the disinterred skeletons of their former comrades on the old Chancellorsville battlefield. The dead horses had dwindled away to bones and the dead men to bones and underclothing, wrote one soldier. I found a dozen skulls and twice as many rods travel, and could doubtless have found scores by a little examination of the thick underbrush. From there, they rushed into battle on May 5th at the extreme southern end of the federal position. On May 6th, they launched the pre-dawn hammer blow that nearly destroyed Lee's army, but seesaw fighting through the rest of the day landed them back where they had begun. Hunkered behind burning earthworks, they staved off the day's final Confederate assaults. Escape from that inferno led them, on May 12th, to Hell's Half Acre. Others called it a Golgotha, a place of skulls, although some of them would have sworn they had camped in such a place already. Most soldiers would come to know the place as the Bloody Angle. A roaring, seething, bubbling hell of hate and murder, said one Mainer. The Second Corps led the assault that broke through the Confederate position there. Only after 22 hours of hand-to-hand -hand combat did Lee's army repel them and successfully regroup. Again on May 18th, the Second Corps charged the Confederate works. In the six days between those slaughters, they'd marched and countermarched in the mud. By May 20th, they were deeply battle-weary. When they set off on the march for Bowling Green, it was 10 p.m. They were ahead of schedule, under the cloak of darkness. It was a beautiful moonlit night, one soldier reflected, and the tedium of a night march, when sleep was much needed, was somewhat relieved as we reflected that during the day the heat and dust would have been almost intolerable. Around 12.30, the infantry arrived at Massaponix Church at the intersection with Telegraph Road, the main north-south route between Fredericksburg and Richmond. There they waited for their cavalry escort, commanded by Brigadier General Alfred Torbert. By 2 a.m., the column once again marched on, south this time, along Telegraph Road. A push straight south would have led to the North Anna River and, miles beyond, Richmond. Had Grant originally started this movement as a race for the North Anna, having the initiative, he might have easily won it, one of Lee's officers later suggested. But Grant never had any serious designs on the Confederate capital. Lee's army, not Richmond, was his stated objective. So, several hundred yards down the road, Hancock struck east again, toward Guinea Station. Some have since lamented Hancock's move as one of the missed opportunities of the campaign rousing that started almost immediately. There would probably have been more chance of success at Hancock moved by the Telegraph Road on the night of the 20th, followed by Warren, said Major General Andrew Humphreys, acting more as the armchair general than Meade's chief of staff. Winning the race would have brought on a collision before Lee could entrench on new ground, he believed. While the North Anna might certainly have offered a strong defensible position for the Federal Army, Grant almost certainly knew Lee would not have assailed him there. If Grant's attentions were to bring Lee to battle, the position along the North Anna would have discouraged the very thing Grant wanted. Better for Hancock to look isolated, not invulnerable, if Grant had any hope of enticing Lee to snap at the bait. It had to dangle farther away. Had they known their role, perhaps Hancock's men might have been less sanguine about their march. The full moon dropped from sight, and the trees, pressed so close to the road during the early part of the trip, dropped away into a more open landscape. 
Caroline County had not yet been touched by war. As Hancock's column marched across the county line, however, a fight awaited them. Horsemen of the 9th Virginia Cavalry, local boys, all of them, set to defend the land they lived on. The first hometown welcome came when the Virginians ambushed Torbert's cavalry at about 4.30 a.m., just as the Federals approached Guinea Station. While no one was hurt, it snapped Torbert's men into a state of alert, enabling them to avoid a second ambush a few minutes later. Soon, the two cavalry units were entangled in a fight over control of a small bridge over the Mattapanai, Guinea Bridge. A few miles later, the two units scrapped over a second bridge, Downers Bridge, which Torbert again left to the Confederates. Torbert, content to protect Hancock's column rather than get into an all-out brawl, let the Confederates keep control of both bridges. Hancock concurred, and onward they went. Twilight came, gradually unveiling what one soldier called an unearthly paradise. Another marveled that the corn now was miles high. Although there were still swamps, thickets, and streams with difficult approaches, a federal officer later noted, the country was generally now more open and presented many clearings, and the range of vision was largely increased. The roads were broad and the land was well cultivated, and the crops were abundant. The deep gloom of the wilderness, he said, had been left behind. It was a feast to the eye and a joy to the soul, a soldier said. The officers and men had never experienced a more sudden change of feelings and prospects, the officer said. The men had been withdrawn from the scenes of their terrific struggles at Spotsylvania and were no longer confronting formidable earthworks. They seemed to breathe a new atmosphere and were inspired with new hope. It was on to Richmond again, the officer said. The weeks of battle weariness melted away with the miles. Men sang as they marched. All knew there was an important point to be gained, and the men were as cheerful as they could be, an officer with 125th New York said. The men never marched with so little complaining or so little straggling. The day was a warm and pleasant one, one soldier said, and our march through a country as fresh and bright as any we had seen since our march into Pennsylvania the year before was more like a picnic excursion than a trial of speed with our enemy. One New York artillerist called it the best agricultural region he had seen in Virginia. We, the ever-hungry, predatory enlisted men, quickly discovered that we were marching through a corn and tobacco and stock-raising country, he wrote, and we raided tobacco barns in a quiet manner and killed some sheep and many chickens and much food was stolen from the farmhouses. By 7 a.m., the cavalry reached Bowling Green, followed by the infantry at nine. Hundreds of slaves greeted them as liberators. Hancock's men ransacked the town. Our army operating in hostile territory was like a swarm of locusts, one of them said. Then they reassembled for the final four-mile march to Milford Station. There, Torbert had to chase off units of Confederate reinforcements bound for Lee's army. Hancock's arrival around noon provided the final incentive for the last rebel holdouts to surrender. We could look back from the hilltops and see the long, steel-tipped column stretching for miles behind us, one Federal said as they made the last leg of the march. Meade's orders to Hancock empowered the 2nd Corps commander to go all the way to the Confederate supply base at Hanover Junction. But suddenly, Hancock thought better of it. What had started out as a pleasant day for marching had curdled into something sweltering and oppressive, and not just the weather. Far from the rest of the army, his men, exhausted by their 14-hour march, with an unexpectedly strong force of Confederates in the area and poor lines of communication to his rear, Hancock decided to protect himself by hunkering down and waiting for Grant to spring his trap. The Army of the Potomac's hardest-hitting commander, worn down by weeks of fighting, had become uncharacteristically wary. The work of entrenching was continued until formidable earthworks frowned upon the horizon in every direction, giving courage to the men, a New Yorker said. Only after the men settled in did they realize what they'd accomplished, although not all of them saw it triumphantly. 
A long, weary, dusty march, one Bay State officer decried. The men suffered greatly for water, which was very scarce, and the roads were very heavy with dust. It had been the longest and most trying march of all we made, said another. The bone weariness began to creep back in, another complained. The ceaseless marching by day and sometimes by night, the digging and the fighting were telling upon our men, in some cases almost as seriously as wounds. They had no way of knowing that their grueling day's work had already come to naught. At Bowling Green First known as New Hope when it was founded in the mid-1740s, Bowling Green was incorporated in 1837, shortly after the Caroline County Courthouse was built to serve as the county seat. Prior to the war, the village of 300 inhabitants had a pair of churches, a pair of mills, and three stores, as well as the courthouse. A Confederate monument now stands outside the building. Known as the Cradle of American Horse Racing, the town also boasts the second oldest Masonic Lodge in the country. A highlight in Bowling Green is the Sidney E. King Arts Center, located at 121 North Main Street. King, who lived just outside of town, created dozens of oil paintings for a number of national parks, which used them as the centerpieces of their interpretation. King painted well into his 90s, finally passing away in 2002. Around that time, as many parks began to modernize their interpretation, they began to retire his paintings. Fourteen of his Civil War paintings have since been collected by the King Art Center, which was established in 2013 in cooperation between the town, Caroline County, and Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. King also painted a mural of the village in May 1864, now on display on the village green. Milford Station, three miles to the west of town, served as the local stop for the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad. It consisted of a depot, engine house, a few scattered dwelling houses, outhouses, and shops. It was also the furthest point to which the train ran, said a member of Pickett's division sent there on May 20th, 1864, and this was the last train that reached there that season. Chapter 3 The Fog of War May 21st, 1864 Lee glassed the earthworks across the field from him. All signs suggested that the Federals still occupied them, but he needed to be sure. Too many other odd reports had come in, too much scattered information. He needed to be sure. Lee turned in his saddle to the battery commander. Open your guns on the enemy's position, he ordered. With a boom, the artillery opened. Three times its number responded, an observer later said. The shells came thick and fast. Lee's horse, Traveler, stood perfectly calm. Lee, too, appeared entirely unperturbed. But the Alabama troops supporting the battery began to get agitated at the thought of Lee, an obvious target atop his tall horse, getting hit. Finally, unable to control himself any longer, one of the Alabamians jumped up. "'Won't someone take that damn fool away from there?' he shouted in nearly a frenzy. Lee dropped his binoculars and looked at the man, but said nothing. Returning the field glasses to their case, Lee then rode off. It was mid-morning, and the Confederate commander had spent his entire day thus far trying to figure out what Grant was up to. He'd first received news that something was afoot shortly after 1 a.m., Word had come of a federal movement along the Massaponics Church Road. Indeed, Hancock was, even then, at the church, waiting for his cavalry escort to saddle up. Lee, anticipating that Grant would eventually try to outflank him, had prepared for such an eventuality, but he wouldn't mobilize without concrete evidence of Grant's movement. On May 11th, Lee had entertained similar suspicions and mobilized part of his army to counter— but his miscalculation that day had led to disastrous results at the mule shoe. Convinced the threat toward Massaponics was indeed real, his first directive was quick and decisive. He ordered Ewell to move the Second Corps south to Snell and then east to Mud Tavern, where Ewell was to hold the intersection with the Telegraph Road. 
Hill and Anderson would eventually follow, but for now, their jobs were to stay in the earthworks to fend off any part of the Federal Army still around Spotsylvania Courthouse. After all, Lee did not know how much of Grant's army was on the road and how much still faced him on the Spotsylvania battlefield. Ewell was on the march by 3 a.m., and by 10 he was deploying his men around the intersection as instructed. Possessing the Telegraph Road was vital. Doing so would give Lee the inside track southward and prevent Grant from having that same track. And indeed, Grant did have his eye on that road. Although he dangled the Hancock out as bait farther to the east, his planned move south called for Warren's Fifth Corps to advance straight down the Telegraph Road. Ewell's movement to Mud Tavern closed that route to Warren. It also essentially cut off Hancock's Second Corps, moving toward Bowling Green. By mid-morning, Grant's plan, barely twelve hours old, had already become unhinged. May 21st dawned clear over Spotsylvania County, but the fog of war hung over Lee's headquarters as he looked at the map and tried to puzzle out Grant's intentions. "'He is apparently placing the Mattapanai between us,' he wrote to the Confederate War Department. "'I am extending on the telegraph road and will regulate my movements by the information received.'" Yet, with Stuart not just gone away but gone forever— and the Cavalry Corps still reeling from that blow, information was a little trickier to come by at just that moment, and even trickier to decipher. Lee had reports of Sheridan's cavalry still operating near Richmond. He had reports of gunboats moving up the Rappahannock toward Port Royal. He had reports of Federal infantry in Bowling Green. Yet he also apparently had plenty of infantry right in front of him in the works at Spotsylvania. The enemy left in his trenches the usual amount of force generally visible, and the reports of movement were so vague and conflicting that it required some time to sift the truth, he would explain to President Davis the next day. Lee feared that Grant's route on the far side of the Mattapanai River would secure him from attack till he crosses the Pamunkey. All three tributaries of the river— the Matta, the Po, and the Nye would serve as geographic barriers to Lee, thus securing Grant's right flank as the Federal Army moved southward. Lee had to let the situation develop further, he decided, although every passing moment put Grant closer to Richmond. The day before, on May 20th, Grant had uncharacteristically slept in something especially unusual, considering the unrelenting grind of the armies since the beginning of the month. Perhaps that grind had caught up with him, although he awoke feeling refreshed, he claimed. Today, May 21st, was different. Up before dawn, deluged with early morning reports that Confederates were on the move. They had reacted to Hancock's movement far quicker than he'd expected. Communication from Hancock, meanwhile, arrived infrequently, after hours of delay. Grant was, by this point in the campaign, smoking as many as 20 cigars a day. Today, he started in on them early. He puffed away as he considered his options. Go at the Confederate line around Spotsylvania? Drive down the Telegraph Road and hit Ewell head on and order Hancock to swing in on the flank? He, like Lee, was at a loss. It was unlike Grant to second-guess himself like this, too. But Lee had taught Grant some hard lessons about respect over the past few weeks. With exhaustion weighing on him, too, Grant seemed uncharacteristically unaggressive. He opted for the safest option. Reinforce Hancock. Grant readjusted his original plan by ordering Warren to follow the path Hancock had taken to Guinea Station. Aside from being a safer route... It would also put Warren in a position to reinforce Hancock should the 2nd Corps commander need it. Burnside's 9th Corps would strike down the Telegraph Road, with Wright's 6th Corps to follow. If Ewell tried to make a stand at Mud Tavern, he would be caught in a pincer movement between the two wings of Grant's army, forcing Confederates to withdraw. The last thing Grant wanted was for Lee to dig in around Mud Tavern, which would turn into a replay of Spotsy. Grant wanted Lee in the open. 
but Lee had his eyes on a stronger position than Mud Tavern. He had finally cast his gaze southward toward the North Anna River, a position he had scoped out nearly a year and a half earlier. That had been his intended line of defense in the late fall of 1862, but Confederate President Jefferson Davis had ordered Lee northward to defend Fredericksburg instead. With its steep banks and west-to-east flow, the North Anna made a formidable topographical roadblock. Augmented by engineering, particularly with what the Army had learned on the fly over the past three weeks, the position could be nigh well impregnable. If Grant got there first and enjoyed those same advantages, however, Lee knew it could well doom the Confederacy. Ensconced between Richmond and the Army of Northern Virginia, Grant could hold Lee at bay while Federals swept down and captured the Confederate capital. Any attempts to prevent them from doing so would likely require assaults that would prove ruinous to Lee's smaller army, or would require maneuvers that would take too long to execute. Lee had to beat Grant to the river. And, with Ewell guarding the intersection at Mud Tavern, Lee now had the inside track. Getting away would not be quite so easy, though. Chapter 4 Leaving Spotsylvania, May 21st, 1864. Both armies spent May 21st testing each other as the commanders tried to figure out just who was where. Lee and Grant each worried the other would pounce on him at any moment, a surprising frame of mind for two generals best known for their aggressiveness. Weeks earlier, in the midst of the wilderness, Grant had admonished his men, Try to think what we are going to do ourselves, instead of what Lee is going to do. Yet today, Lee's next move was all Grant could worry about. Have your pickets fire away occasionally at the enemies, and ascertain all they can and report, Meade ordered Warren and Wright. But by ten o'clock, Warren was pulling out, marching down Massaponic Church Road in Hancock's wake. Burnside was set to follow at four, with Wright bringing up the rear sometime between 6.30 and 7. Grant and Meade traveled with Warren's column. Weather hot, roads dusty, the springs few and small, Meade's staffer, Theodore Lyman, reported. By 11, they reached the Telegraph Road. This church, a plain brick building, stands at the crossing. There, the generals made headquarters for a couple of hours as they again assessed the situation. Staff members hauled pews from the church and set them in a wide circle beneath an oak tree. Couriers and officers swirled about. Grant, legs crossed, studied his maps, and smoked. "'Ready again to report for duty,' Ambrose Powell Hill said to Lee." Once Lee's most aggressive and dependable division commander, Hill had been promoted a year earlier to head the new Third Corps, where he never performed up to expectations. Part of the problem, at least, was that he could never operate at full capacity. A venereal disease he'd contracted as a cadet at West Point some two decades earlier still plagued him, flaring up on occasion, just as it had a couple of weeks ago. Hill had missed all of the fight at Spotsylvania, his corps temporarily commanded by the irascible Jubal Early. Short and slight, with a bushy red beer, little Powell hardly looked the picture of robustness on the best of days, but he must have looked even more diminished on that morning. Still, Lee needed Hill's experience, and so the Gray Fox reshuffled commands and allowed Hill to resume his duties. His first task, along with Anderson, was to send forward skirmishers to test the Federal front. Unless we can drive these people out, or find out where they are all gone, we are detained here to our disadvantage, Lee told Anderson. Their first probe at 3 p.m. found plenty of Yankees. Another foray at 6 p.m. found plenty, too. In fact, enough to erupt into a nasty little fight. Brigadier Generals James Lane and Alfred Scales advanced with their brigades near Zion Church at the western end of Massaponics Road. I'll bet five dollars there isn't a Yankee in those works, 
a North Carolinian boasted. But in fact, the works were full of Vermonters. Initially, the Green Mountain Boys fell back. They had been roughly handled at Harris Farm just a few days earlier and had little belly for another manhandling. But soon, reinforcements arrived along with two federal batteries. The batteries opened fire with withering effect, checking the southern advance. A reb charge upon our lines and for once in their lives get a belly so full as to cause puking and purging at the same time, boasted a 6th Corps surgeon who called the incident a perfect amidiocathatric, a medical treatment that purged the body fluids from a patient at both ends. But for Lee, the incident was just what the general ordered. He had discovered that Burnside had slipped away, leaving only Wright in the works as the rear guard. It was time to get his own men moving. While Hill and Anderson were sending forward their 3 p.m. probe, the Federal column, making its way toward Guinea Station, found trouble of its own. The roads were wide and good and the country well cultivated, Grant noted about the trip. No men were seen except those bearing arms, even the black men having been sent away. The country, however, was new to us, and we had neither guides nor maps to tell us where the roads were or where they led to. Engineer and staff officers were pulled to the dangerous duty of supplying the place of both maps and guides. Sheridan's absence was keenly felt. But if Grant wanted horsemen, the Ninth Virginia Cavalry was happy to oblige. Since their brush with Torbert that morning, they'd been holding the Guinea Bridge. Grant needed the bridge cleared so that it could serve as a link with Burnside and Wright, who would soon be traveling down Telegraph Road to the west. Grant and Meade and their staffs, by this time, had advanced ahead of Warren's column. Rather than withdraw to safety, there would be no turning back, remember. Grant sent word for Warren to hurry forward. Then he and Meade organized the headquarters guard for an attack on the rebel cavalrymen. As the makeshift force approached the bridge, though, Confederates torched it. Federals managed to push across the river, drive back the cavalry, and save most of the bridge. In support, a pair of regiments from Warren's column arrived, securing the road westward. I have met the enemy, and he is mine, the head of the headquarters guard crowed. Grant settled in for the afternoon at the Motley House, a stately home that lies on the high swell that overlooks the meadowland where the Poe and Nye join, a staffer wrote. It was a good house, with store of fruit trees and rose bushes and flower, the strawberries beginning to ripen and the apples as big as bullets. The owner of the house, Edmund Motley, was an elderly man of a certain sour dignity, a bitter rebel plainly. Grant and his aide, Horace Porter, had not rested there long before Motley snapped at them. You're trying to burn down my house! Grant looked up from his cigar. Its ashy tip had just flaked off into a small pile on the floor of the porch where he sat. The ashes were no more in danger of burning down the house than Grant himself was, though. The fieriest thing on that porch was Motley's temper. Still, Grant and Porter excused themselves and took a stroll looking for a more hospitable porch. They found one at the next plantation, less than a mile east, Fairfield. They settled onto a pair of chairs in the shade and continued their conversation. A few minutes later, the front door swung open. "'Why, good afternoon, gentlemen,' the lady of the house asked. "'How may I be of service to you?' Whether she knew it was Grant or not at first, she soon learned his identity. He and Porter stood, took off their hats, and introduced themselves. She was Mary Chandler, she said. This was her husband's plantation, Fairfield, although he was not available to welcome them himself. Mrs. Chandler charmed her guests as though they were old friends, not invaders, and they had something in common, too. To illustrate... She drew their attention to the small white office building that sat near the main house. The building had witnessed some sad scenes, she said. One of our great generals died here just a year ago, General Jackson, Stonewall Jackson of blessed memory. Grant's last year at West Point had overlapped with Jackson's first, 
lo, those many years ago, so the two had known each other, but not well, Grant confided. Then you must have known what a great and good man he was, Mrs. Chandler said. Oh, yes, Grant replied. He was a sterling manly cadet and enjoyed the respect of everyone who knew him. Grant recalled Jackson's indomitable energy and spoke of him as a gallant soldier and a Christian gentleman. I can understand fully the admiration your people have for him, he said. Mrs. Chandler, overcome by Grant's words and the sad memories from a year earlier, nearly broke down as the conversation continued. Grant took the opportunity to politely excuse himself, and he and Porter made their leave. Much still weighed on the lieutenant general's mind. Lee now had a superb opportunity to take the initiative by attacking Wright and Burnside alone, he later explained in his memoirs, or by following the telegraph road and striking Hancock's and Warren's corps, or even Hancock alone, before reinforcements could come up. As it would turn out, Lee did not avail himself of either opportunity. He seemed really to be misled as to my designs. Hindsight would allow Grant to see it as one of the great missed opportunities of the campaign. He never again had such an opportunity of dealing a heavy blow. But on the late afternoon of May 21st, as Grant walked from the Chandler house back to his headquarters at Motley's, puffing again on a cigar, he could not understand Lee's lack of aggressiveness. However, miles away and just as confused as Grant, Lee had indeed begun thinking aggressively, but he was thinking about aggressive speed, not power. Grant had left the road to the North Anna wide open, and Lee was about to make his dash. At Massaponics Church Established in 1788 as a log cabin near Massaponics Creek, the congregation moved to its current site, at the intersection of what is now Modern Route 1 and State Route 608. The current structure dates back to 1859. According to the church, the bricks for the exterior walls of the church were made and burned in a kiln in a nearby field. The Civil War brought church services to a standstill. Southern and Northern forces used the building at various times, most notably Grant and Meade on May 21, 1864. According to the church history, the walls of the church were filled with stories of trying times, crude battle scenes, messages of love, and the names of companies, troops, and soldiers. The graffiti, once whitewashed and later restored, remains visible today. Chapter 5. The Night March. May 21st through 22nd, 1864. Although he does not get credit for it, May 21st, 1864, was one of Richard Ewell's finest days of the campaign. At 1.30 a.m., to the sound of drums beating reveille, his second corps rousted itself for a march that began at 3 a.m. By 10, they had completed the eight-and-a-half-mile march through Snell to Mud Tavern along the Telegraph Road. Such marches came second nature to the men who had once been known as Jackson's Foot Cavalry, but the once vaunted Second Corps was now a shadow of its former self, whittled down to fewer than 8,000 men. Spotsylvania had been particularly hard on them, with bruising fights on May 10th, May 12th, and May 19th. The 12th in particular, the fight at the Mule Shoe, had cost them some 4,000 casualties. The 19th, at Harris Farm, had seen the entire Corps nearly overwhelmed. Ewell had saved the day on the 10th, but during the collapse of his line on the 12th, the profane, impatient Ewell lost his cool in front of Lee. "'General Ewell, you must restrain yourself,' Lee had cautioned. "'How can you expect to control these men when you have lost control of yourself?' "'If Ewell could not restrain his excitement,' Lee said, "'he had better retire.'" Ewell's inability to control his subordinates at Harris Farm a few days later, on May 19th, nearly led to the Corps' annihilation. The twin debacles were the beginning of the end for Ewell. Although Ewell did not know it yet, Lee had essentially retired him already, at least mentally. To hedge his bets, 
Lee reorganized Ewell's two divisions into three, commanded by three strong subordinates, Major General Robert Rhodes, Major General Jubal Early, and Brigadier General John Brown Gordon. Lee had been pleased with Gordon's actions on May 12th in particular, and pleased with the way Early had handled the Third Corps during Hill's illness, so he wanted to keep both men in positions of responsibility available should Lee need to call on them. So perhaps it's in that context that Ewell's movement on May 21st gets so little credit, although Lee certainly saw it at the time as vital. Just as Anderson's fleet-footed march out of the wilderness on the night of May 7th secured key ground for the army on the morning of May 8th, so now did Ewell's quick march out of Spotsylvania secure the telegraph road for the Confederates, giving Lee the direct route to the North Anna. Deploying first at Mud Tavern to protect the intersection, Ewell then pushed men northward along the road, a long downward slope to the Poe River a mile away. There they fortified along the south bank and awaited the appearance of anything Grant might throw at them. As the situation around Spotsylvania unfolded and Lee got a better picture of Grant's movements, he wanted to exploit the advantage Ewell had gained for him. In a wooded country like that in which we had been operating, where nothing is known beyond what can be ascertained by feeling, a day's march can always be gained, Lee would explain to President Jefferson Davis. Now was the time to start playing catch-up. Leave enough men to hold the intersection and march south along the Telegraph Road, Lee instructed the 2nd Corps commander. He also put Anderson and Hill on notice for a quick move, although much depended on what they found out as they probed the Federal lines throughout the afternoon. At noon, Ewell started southward, leaving a cavalry screen and a group of engineers to guard the river crossing. The first Federal troops to appear at the river, Curtin's Brigade of the Ninth Corps, had traveled part of their way cross-country. They materialized on the telegraph road seemingly out of the brush itself, then pushed south. When they reached the banks of the Po, Curtin ordered a halt. He did not at all like the looks of the fortifications he saw on the far side. He had no way to know then how thinly held those works were, though. Rather than assault, he ordered his men to deploy and await reinforcements. The rest of Burnside's men arrived after dark, coming straight down the Telegraph Road with the intention of making an arrow-straight march to the North Anna River. Curtin's deployment was the last thing they expected to see. Nonetheless, with the strength of the entire Corps now bearing down, the potential for a federal blow seemed sure. Except Burnside elected not to attack. Unsure of how many Confederates were in front of him, he did not want to risk a fight he couldn't handle on ground he didn't know. Choosing caution instead, he exercised the discretion Grant had given him in his marching orders, opting to backtrack and follow Warren instead of pushing onward. This created the additional domino effect of delaying Wright, who was to follow Burnside south along the Telegraph Road. Instead, the 6th Corps commander had to hold up so Burnside's corps could untangle itself and double back to the very intersection at Massaponix Church that Wright himself needed. Had Burnside pushed forward, the river crossing, mud tavern, and the telegraph road would have been his for the asking. Thus did the Federals miss their first opportunity in the North Anna phase of the campaign, and the night was not yet over. Even as Burnside doubled back on himself, causing a traffic snarl that delayed his march even more, Major General Richard H. Anderson was pulling the Confederate First Corps out of their earthworks. Lee had ordered him to follow Ewell's route to Mud Tavern and then south along the Telegraph Road. A.P. Hill's Third Corps was to pull out no later than 9 p.m. and follow a parallel route south that would take him to Chilesburg, then further south to the banks of the North Anna, at Jericho's Mill. Lee seems not to have been tempted at all to overwhelm Horatio Wright's isolated 6th Corps left alone as the Federal rear guard at Spotsylvania. To do so would have been possible with Lee's advantage in numbers on the battlefield itself, but it would have taken time. 
time that Grant could have used to march to the gates of Richmond itself. For the time being, Lee had to content himself to march to Grant's tune. And so it was, as the late hours of May 21st passed into the wee hours of May 22nd, that Ewell's Second Corps and Anderson's First Corps were stretched out for miles along the Telegraph Road. By then, Federals knew the road was in Confederate hands. Confederates, on the other hand, did not know that Warren's Fifth Corps was encamped just one or two miles on their left flank. Warren might easily have pushed westward along the Guinea Station Road, hitting the Telegraph Road at Mud Tavern, and striking Anderson's men in the flank as they marched by. Or Warren might have pushed westward at Nancy Wright's Corners to the south, striking Ewell's men in the flank as they marched by. However, Warren felt too isolated to do anything. Hancock was too far away to the south to offer support, and Burnside and Wright were both ensnarled on back roads to the north. One of Warren's aides, Washington Roebling, bristled. Here was a chance to capture the whole of Lee's wagon train. Never was the want of cavalry more painfully felt. Such opportunities are offered once in a campaign and should not be lost. But of course... Sheridan was nowhere to be found. Instead, the 5th Corps commander ordered his men to take up a defensive position overnight. This rendered necessary by the difficulties having been met by General Burnside in getting to the position assigned to him, an artillerist groused. This command will be prepared to move at 4 a.m. tomorrow, Warren blustered the object being to take up at that time a defensive position in this vicinity to receive an attack of the enemy should he advance in this direction. And so evaporated the Federals' second great opportunity of the North Anna phase of the campaign. Lee, at the vanguard of Anderson's column, reached Mud Tavern around 10 p.m. and turned south. Artillerist Porter Alexander noted, the unusual silence of the ranks as they marched, despite the pleasant weather. There was none of the usual joking and chatting among the men, although all were in good humor, but they were serious and created the impression of being on serious business. Twenty miles south, Ewell's men arrived in Golensville. Milford Station was eight miles east, the North Anna nine miles south, a distance the Second Corps could quickly cover in the morning. Grant got the start yesterday, Ewell would write to his wife once he crossed the river, but by marching all night and this morning I am again in front, and the rest of the army is well up. The position of Grant's army is this, he added, beaten, terrible losses, worn out. His chances are in his numbers that might stand killing until we are worn out, and he still has some left to use but the chances are against this. By that time, George Gordon Meade was eating breakfast at camp near the Motley House, and he had heard of the missed opportunity along the Telegraph Road and the Confederate getaway. Not the way he wanted to start his day. I'm afraid the rebellion cannot be crushed this summer, he snarled. It was a reflection not just of his frustration with the Confederates, but with his own boss as well. Chapter 6. Wherever Lee Goes. May 22, 1864. Robert E. Lee greeted the morning of May 22nd in a mood not much less peevish than George Meade's. I should have preferred contesting the enemy's approach inch by inch, Lee wrote in a dispatch to Jefferson Davis at 5 a.m. that morning. Lee had arrived at Ewell's headquarters at Golensville sometime around three. He supped, retired to his cot for a brief nap, then was back at his duties by dawn, and his dander was up. The previous day had been frustrating, filled with confusing intelligence, second-guessing, near-misses, and missed opportunities, long marches, and little sleep. At one point his army had been stretched out over more than 15 miles, and Grant's more than 20. Perhaps most frustrating, he still had no clear idea of Grant's objective. As soon as I can get more positive information concerning the movements of the enemy, I will forward it to you, 
Lee wrote to Davis before mounting up. At least he had won the race to the North Anna, or nearly so. By six, he was on the road again for the last nine miles. By 8.30, he reached the river's north bank and crossed Chesterfield Bridge. The toll Lee paid had been enormous. General Lee looked very much worn and troubled, an observer noted. The terrible responsibilities that had been forced upon him and the strain to which he had been subjected for the three or four weeks past were telling on his endurance, and added to this, he was a really sick man. The stress of command, the lack of sleep, the hot, humid days, the stretch of rain, and the non-stop campaign of fight and maneuver, the war of attrition, was starting to wear him down. The same was true for Jubal Early's division of the Second Corps, who had been in the vanguard for the river crossing. Lee ordered Early to form them into a defensive line to protect the bridge. General Lee, my men are wearied and weakened from the march, Early protested. They're exhausted and need rest. Lee snapped back, General Early, you must not tell me these things, but when I give an order, see that it is executed. Lee rode off. Watching him go, Early muttered, General Lee is much troubled and not well. Grant smoked a cigar and pondered his options. The Confederates had given him the slip. Should he go after them? Should he keep pushing left and south? If he went after them, it meant concentrating the army along the Telegraph Road and pushing across the North Anna right at Lee, who would no doubt be dug in on the far side. Grant again thought of the rail lines he could use and the ones he could deny to Lee. If he kept sidling left and south, though, he could force Lee to come after him. They could fight in open country. Meade, in fact, argued this option strongly. Why pick another fight against an entrenched foe? If Lee was waiting for them at the North Anna River, it would be because Lee wanted them to find him there. But maybe Lee would be too exhausted and fought out, Grant wondered. After all, why had the aggressive Lee passed on the chance to strike the day before? If Grant moved farther east, would it not take more time and thus give Lee more time to recover? Might it not also force Lee closer to his own supply base? Meade was opposed to our crossing the North Anna. Meade was opposed to our crossing the North Anna. Provost Marshal Brigadier General Marcina Patrick later recounted, but Grant ordered it over his head. In the end, this was no war of attrition. It was a war of annihilation. Grant could not afford to wear Lee down over time. With the election clock ticking, Grant had to destroy the Confederate Army as soon as possible. And in order to do that, he had to take the fight to them whenever possible. Lee's army shall be your objective, he had told Meade before the campaign opened, and he reminded himself of that now. Wherever Lee goes, there you will go also. Grant ordered Warren to shift to the Telegraph Road, where he and Wright were to push south. Burnside was to continue on to rendezvous with Hancock, who could spend the remainder of the 22nd resting. Together, they would converge with the other two corps near Mount Carmel Church, sometime on the afternoon of May 23rd. Grant planned to cross the army at Chesterfield Bridge and to the west, Jericho Ford. The map only shows two roads for the four corps to march upon, he wrote, but no doubt by the use of plantation roads and Pressing in guides, others can be found to give one for each corps. Left unsaid was the fact that the cavalry, had it been there, could have found those secondary roads instead. But Sheridan's absence continued. As Warren's men pushed westward to the Telegraph Road, it didn't take them long to discover the opportunity that had passed them by overnight. I fear that Grant had made a botch of this move also, for Lee is certainly ahead of us now, wrote artillerist Charles Wainwright. 
First Corps, was only a few hours ahead of us, and we've been picking up stragglers ever since we started. We must have over a hundred of them. A brigade of cavalry ahead of us would have secured five times as many, and had Sheridan been here instead of no one knows where, we should have been sure of the junction. Crossing the Mattapani River at Downer's Bridge, Grant's party ascended the curving road and came upon a large brick plantation house beautifully situated on the ridge above, commanding a charming view of the river. A glorious clover field stretched out along the roadside there. Grant's and Meade's staffs set up their headquarters there while the officers retired to the front porch of the house to consult. The home was owned by old Mrs. Tyler and her daughter-in-law, both strong rebels, said Meade's aide, Theodore Lyman. The older was a simple and narrow person. She had lost a son at Shapsburg. The ladies both came out to greet their unexpected guests, and the younger Mrs. Tyler in particular chatted politely. Her mother-in-law, not so much. I do hope you will not let your soldiers ruin our place and carry away our property, the older woman scowled. I will order a guard to keep the men out of your place and see that you are amply protected, Grant assured her. As the party broke up, the older woman approached Porter. What was the name of that officer? she whispered to him. That's General Grant, he replied. Porter's reply set off another flurry of interaction, this one decidedly more excited. The younger Mrs. Tyler had a husband serving in the Western Theater under Joseph Johnston, she revealed. Even at that moment, Sherman was advancing against Johnston's forces near Rome, Georgia. General Sherman will never take that place, the older woman huffed. I know all about that country, and you haven't an army that will ever take it. Just then, whether attracted by all the commotion on the porch or whether he was looking for Army headquarters, Ninth Corps Commander Ambrose Burnside rode up. The 39-year-old general cut a striking figure with his distinctive bushy sideburns, and his big spurs and saber rattled as he walked. He was a man of great gallantry and elegance of manner, Porter later said of him. Lyman was less generous in his characterization. Burnside has a sharp military jacket, and with his bell-crowned felt hat, the brim turned down, presents an odd figure, the fat man. Burnside, always exceedingly polite to women, raised his hat and offered a deep bow. I don't suppose, madam, that you ever saw so many live Yankees before, he said cordially, indicating the army around him. Not a liberty, sir, she growled. She had recently come from Richmond, where the house she stayed in overlooked the prison camp on Belle Isle. I had the satisfaction of looking down every day on Yankee prisoners, she informed him. I saw thousands and thousands of them. Before this campaign is over, I want to see the whole of the Yankee army in southern prisons. While everyone had a good laugh at her clever comeback, the last laugh was about to be Grant's. Couriers continued to come and go, and among them came a dispatch from Sherman. Grant glanced it over, then read it aloud. Sherman had taken Rome. The wife burst into tears, recalled Porter, and the mother-in-law was much affected by the news, which was, of course, sad tidings to both of them. Bivouacked on a beautiful spot, Sixth Corps Surgeon Daniel Holt wrote that night, the Army's campfires winked across farm fields and in groves of trees. A wheat field in which we lie affords provender for weary horses, while the straw makes a comfortable bed. This night and day marching is tough work on our men. We are beginning to feel used up, but full of faith that we are using someone up. I hope it is the rebels. Across the river... One Georgian said he and his fellows all looked like a horse after a week's hard driving on the shortest kind of rations. But that didn't mean used up. Spirits were high among the Confederates who felt that they had bested Grant in the wilderness, had bested him again in Spotsylvania, and had now beaten him to the river. The courage of this army was never better, Lee would write to his wife the following morning and I fear no injury to it from any retrograde movement 
that may be dictated by sound military policy. Now, it wasn't the rebels being used up. It was Lee himself. His exhaustion must have been crushing. Compounding it, he was beginning to feel feverish and crampy. Yet, in a letter to his wife, Mary, the next day, he offered barely a hint of his discomfort. "'Send me my cotton drawers and socks,' he told her. "'My present ones are becoming too warm. "'Yesterday was hot.' "'Ironically, Ewell was writing to his own wife with similar complaints. "'I'm stewing down in my thick winter-knit shirts, and want you, "'if you can do so without more trouble than it is worth, "'to send me the flannel shirts, not knit, "'that are somewhere amongst my traps,' he asked." As I am now, I fear I will melt entirely. Both men blamed it on the weather and their warm winter clothes, but both were getting sick. And just at the time, the Army of Northern Virginia needed its top commanders in top shape. They didn't know it, but Grant was coming right at them. Chapter 7 Before the Storm May 23rd, 1864, morning. Had the Army of Northern Virginia not been so exhausted, the morning of May 23rd might have seemed more relaxed. As it was, men were grateful for the rest. Spring had well matured this far south, and war had never touched here. The bucolic landscape could not be more beautiful. Temperatures again started mild, and the clear sky opened wide and blue. The North Anna River, flowing between its steep banks, sparkled in the sunlight with the same optimism of the army. Men slipped down to the river to bathe. Others caught up on letters to home. It was the first day in weeks where they hadn't been fighting or marching or huddling in the rain. I think I am nearer worn out, dirtier, and more in want of rest. "'Then I have been since I can recollect,' a Georgian said. Lee wanted to give his men the chance to rest, give himself the chance to rest, because he knew there was an inexorable wave of blue moving somewhere across the Virginia countryside to the north. He wanted to be ready for that wave when it hit. The problem was, he didn't know where that would be. In a morning dispatch to Jefferson Davis, Lee surmised that Grant had sought the safety of the far side of the Mattapanai to recruit and reorganize his army, which, as far as I am able to judge, has been very much shaken. Grant could keep himself better protected on the far side of that river and slide further east to the Pamunkey River, formed by the convergence of the Mattapanai and the North Anna, and then make a dash at Richmond that way. But Lee had also heard reports of Grant's efforts to rebuild the railroad coming south from Fredericksburg, which led him to believe Grant would stick with a route that would allow him to take advantage of the rail line. That would make Hanover Junction doubly important to Grant. Capturing it would cut the Confederate supply line from the Shenandoah Valley along the Central Virginia Railroad, while it would also enable Grant to use the RF&P to continue supplying his own army. Although now backed up to within 20 miles of the capital, which limited his ability to maneuver, Lee saw the advantages of his position, which he articulated in a letter later that day to his wife. We have the advantage of being nearer our supplies and less liable to have our communication, trains, etc. cut by his cavalry, and he is getting farther from his base, he wrote. Still, I begrudge every step he makes toward Richmond. Across camp... Lee's aide, Colonel Walter Taylor, was also catching up on his correspondence. His fiancée, Betty, lived in Richmond, and he felt her pull even as the army drew closer to her. The Army of Northern Virginia remained in excellent condition, he told her, as good as it was when we met Grant two weeks since for the first time. The subject of the federal commander seemed to raise Taylor's hackles but also something else. Grant was such a brute, he wrote. He does not pretend to bury his dead, leaves his wounded without proper attendance, and seems entirely reckless as regards the lives of his men. This and his remarkable pertinacity are the only qualifications he has exhibited, which differ in any way from those of his predecessors. 
He certainly holds on longer than any of them. He alone of all would have remained this side of the Rappahannock after the Battle of the Wilderness. This may be attributed to his nature, or it may be because he knew full well that to relinquish his designs on Richmond, even temporarily, would forever ruin him and to bring about peace. This is, I think, surely the last campaign, he told Betty. God grant us assistance to bring it to a speedy and successful issue. Of late, he has certainly favored us most signally. The latest signal of any such favor had rippled through both armies as they had marched south. On May 16th, at Drury's Bluff outside Richmond, Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard repulsed Major General Benjamin Butler's Army of the James. Butler fell back to a defensible location at Bermuda Hundred, and there he stayed, waiting for rescue from Grant. Lee thought this would provide an opportunity for additional reinforcements for a strike at Grant. I should be very glad to have the aid of General Beauregard, he told Davis in his morning dispatch. The Confederate president would not acquiesce, but Beauregard's specter nonetheless loomed large in the doubts of Federals. The Creole general and hero of First Manassas might, at any time, materialize on the field. His reputation didn't carry quite the legendary fame that Stonewall Jackson's had, but any experienced war hero showing up on a battlefield with thousands of fresh reinforcements was something to keep an eye out for. And after all, hadn't John Breckinridge done that very thing? The Confederate Major General had defeated Federal forces at the Battle of Newmarket in the Shenandoah Valley on May 15th, the day before Butler's defeat at Drury's Bluff. And the next day, he loaded his men on a train and brought them to Lee. Might not Beauregard do the same? Beauregard aside, though, Davis had sent other forces Lee's way. Breckinridge, for one, with his 3,600 men. Major General George Pickett's division, the vanguard of which Torbert and Hancock had run into at Milford Station, brought 6,000 men from Drury's Bluff. And the North Carolina Brigade, formerly commanded by Major General Robert Hoke, still called Hoke's Brigade, although it was commanded now by Lieutenant Colonel William Lewis, added another 1,600 men. Colonel Bradley Johnson's Maryland line totaled 2,100 more. That was some 13,300 reinforcements, and every one of them was a veteran. Even better, they were all coming off victories, so their morale was high. Lee had started in the wilderness with 66,000 men. The fighting through Spotsylvania had whittled him down to only 40,000. His new additions brought him back up to more than 53,000 men. Across the river, Grant had suffered a much worse time of it. Starting the campaign with around 120,000 men, the fighting through Spotsylvania had brought him down to 84,000. Sheridan's ill-conceived cavalry jaunt took as many as 12,000 more men off the board. Expiring enlistments, sickness, and detachments to protect the ever-extending supply line all siphoned off even more. As he bled out his army... He replaced many of those men by stripping the garrisons from around Washington, D.C., gaining him some 17,250 reinforcements, plus another 1,800 draftees. All were new soldiers without the battlefield wisdom of veterans, but Grant needed the bodies. They brought his strength back up to just over 68,000 effectives. It is thought that the two armies are now more nearly equal than ever before, Confederate mapmaker Jed Hotchkiss wrote. Indeed, it was as closely matched as the armies had ever been or would ever be again. As the morning grew, the day again promised to be as thick as the few that had preceded it. Foot-weary South Carolinians from John Hennigan's brigade posted on the north side of the river to protect the Chesterfield Bridge, took the opportunity to slip down the steep banks and bathe in the cool water. On the south bank of the river, all along the line, men continued to take advantage of the rare opportunity to unspool and relax. The quiet could not have come too soon for Lee. The non-stop pace of the previous three weeks had worn him so low that he could not even take to horseback to inspect his lines. 
Instead, he hoisted himself into a carriage and directed his driver onward. Near the Telegraph Road, where the Chesterfield Bridge crossed, Lee stopped. Below, a number of the South Carolinians splashed and scrubbed. On the far bank, others lounged in an earthen fortification built to protect the crossing. Constructed in 1863 to protect the road from marauders, the three-sided fort would eventually be known by the name of the man who commanded the brigade defending it, Hennigan's Redoubt. Colonel John Hennigan commanded men still known as Kershaw's Brigade, even though their former brigadier, Joseph Kershaw, had been elevated to division command months earlier. Hennigan had deployed the 2nd South Carolina in the redoubt itself, with the 7th South Carolina deployed to the left of the fort, and the 3rd South Carolina Battalion deployed to its right. Beyond them, the 3rd South Carolina Infantry extended across an open field on the opposite side of Telegraph Road. Into that field, shortly after 11 a.m., materialized a group of Wade Hampton's butternut troopers thundering at full gallop. Nearing the bank of the river, they pulled up, turned around, and consolidated. An equally hell-bent-for-leather group of Federals barreled at them. They were the troopers from Torbert's command, and they'd been dogging Hampton's detachment down the road from Milford Station. Both contingents of cavalry set up artillery pieces and began trading shots, even as the cavalrymen themselves fell into a sharp fight. With Confederate infantry in clear sight, Hennigan's brigade, the Federals fell back, first beyond Long Creek and then farther north, at a cost of one man killed and five wounded. Lee, leaning against a pine tree, watched this exchange through his field glasses. He watched, too, as the Federal cavalry regrouped beyond Long Creek without falling any further back. Yet, Lee seemed unconcerned. This is nothing but a feint, he concluded. The enemy is preparing to cross below. Grant, Lee remained convinced, planned to cross farther to the east, somewhere along the Pamunkey River. There was no need to mobilize his army yet. They needed all the rest they could get. Go back and tell General A.P. Hill to leave his men in camp, Lee ordered. Then he climbed back into his carriage and resumed his inspection. In the 150 years since the war, Lee's historical partisans have often prescribed to him the superpower of reading his opponents and knowing their intentions. And indeed, through much of the war, that seemed to be the case. But that prescription fails to acknowledge the truth that, time and time again through the spring campaign in 1864, Lee's superpower failed him. He could not divine Grant's intentions when the Federal Army first crossed the Rapidan. He misinterpreted Grant's movements on May 11th as a withdrawal, and so removed his own artillery from the Mule Shoe Salient, which directly resulted in the catastrophic collapse of the position. And he spent all of May 21st and 22nd puzzling over Grant's objectives. On the late morning of May 23rd, Lee's so-called superpower failed him once more, as he underestimated the meaning of Torbert's presence. The enemy had followed us up more closely than we seemed to expect, artillerist Porter Alexander later admitted, and he announced himself as if he was in a hurry and meant business. At Hanover Junction. Hanover Junction was strategically important to the Army of Northern Virginia because supplies came in from the Shenandoah Valley along the Central Virginia Railroad. At Hanover Junction, that railroad met up with the North South Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad. The RFP not only transported food, ammunition, and other essentials up from Richmond, it also served as the lifeline that took seriously wounded men to the capital for medical care. During the winter of 1862-63, Lee lived off this lone, tenuous link. He improved his situation in the winter of 63-64 by wintering around Orange Courthouse. There, the Central Virginia Railroad and the southern leg of the Orange and Alexandria Railroads kept him supplied. Although, by the end of the winter, the Confederacy's overall situation was so sparse that Lee found himself making a personal appeal to his wife to send socks. Grant saw the RF&P as a vital route for supplying his army as he advanced farther into enemy territory. While at Spotsylvania, Grant had shifted his supply base from Culpeper, 
30 miles to the northwest, to Fredericksburg, 10 miles to the northeast. From Fredericksburg, supplies could be loaded on the railroad and moved south even as Grant's armies used the roadways. Capturing Hanover Junction would allow Grant to continue to use the railroad to facilitate his line of advance, while also cutting off Lee from the important supplies that came in along the Central Virginia line. The little settlement of Hanover Junction existed to serve the railroads. Aside from a smattering of railroad maintenance buildings, there were a few warehouses which doubled as hospitals for sick and wounded soldiers being transported southward, and a small hotel for people who stopped off to conduct business. Today, the town remains just as small, with a few homes and a small shop to boot, but the rail yard booms and rattles with the train traffic from both CSX Transportation and Amtrak. Chapter 8. The Battle for Hennigan's Redoubt. May 23, 1863. Afternoon. The morning's exertions had exhausted Lee, even as reduced as his duties had been by the carriage. By early afternoon, he found himself resting on the porch of Ellington, a two-story brick home owned by Parson Thomas Fox. The house sat a few hundred yards south of the river. Behind the house, the telegraph road dipped down to the Chesterfield Bridge and northward across the river to the South Carolinians in their earthen redoubt. The front of the house faced the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad, which ran along the far edge of the eastern field. In the yard of the house, Lee's staff chatted amiably amongst themselves, certainly speculating about Grant's intentions, perhaps speculating about their commander's health. Lee, in the shade of the porch, sipped a glass of buttermilk offered to him by Reverend Fox and, no doubt, pondered these same things. Without warning, Federal artillery shells began to rain down around the house, followed shortly by the booms of the cannons that had fired them. Across the river, Federal artillery had rolled into place along the same ridge where, late in the morning, Torbert's cavalry had regrouped. One solid shot whizzed past Lee and lodged itself in the frame of the front door. Amidst the shower of falling shells, Lee finished his glass of buttermilk and politely excused himself, withdrawing from the fox house with the frazzled members of his staff so he could see to business. Grant's army had arrived, and Lee had not been expecting it. What Lee had earlier dismissed as a feint was actually the vanguard of the entire Army of the Potomac. Torbert's cavalry had led the way for Hancock's Second Corps all the way out of Spotsylvania, down through Bowling Green, and on to Milford Station. Even now, Torbert's men served as the heralds for Grant's favorite hammer, which was swinging south onto the Telegraph Road. After the Corps' grueling march two days prior, on May 21st, the march from Milford Station, some 12 miles away, must have seemed a mere jaunt, especially with Torbert's cavalry in the lead, clearing Hampton's cavalry out of the way. There was comparatively little resistance made to check the advancing column, wrote one New Yorker, and nothing to embarrass the grand flank movement of the Second Corps. Grant had tasked Hancock with hitting the Chesterfield crossing head-on. In addition, the 2nd Corps commander had to cover the railroad bridge several hundred yards to the east. To the west, Hancock had to extend his alignment far enough to link up with Burnside's 9th Corps, which had been ordered to Ox Ford a few miles upstream. At 1.45 p.m., Hancock reported that he had reached the North Anna. I'm putting skirmishers down to the bridge and ford, and we will see if it is possible to command their approaches, he reported, adding... I'm extending my troops across the railroad also. Shortly after 2.30, he offered an update. My skirmishers are across, he said, and I am just pushing them forward a short distance. I'm planting batteries to have a cover fire. As the skirmishers soon realized, however, Hancock had not found the river at all, but rather Long Creek, only a few hundred yards and one steep ridge line to the north of the North Anna. The narrow stream had steep banks similar to those of the Nye and the Mattapanai rivers, which had proven inconvenient to cross. It's little wonder that Hancock mistook Long Creek for a similar river, 
particularly since it didn't show up on federal maps. It did not take him long to discover his mistake, though, and at four he sent a corrective dispatch back to Army headquarters. The creek, he admitted, is not the river. The North Anna ran just beyond the next rise, and Hancock soon found it, along with the redoubt brimming with South Carolinians. What lay beyond on the South Bank remained a mystery, but Hancock chose to test the situation. I think the earthworks can be taken between the creek and the river, he predicted. I'm waiting for my artillery to open. The country was so wooded and unknown, he later added, and little favorable for artillery that deployments were taking time. Hennigan's men watched the deployment unfold in almost slow motion, their dread growing with each unanswered plea for help they sent rearward. Soon enough, Hancock's artillery along the ridge opened fire, lobbing shells over the river to probe the far shore, disrupting Lee and his glass of buttermilk in the process. Hancock had no way of knowing how close his opening salvos had come to decapitating the Confederate army. Not that the South Carolinians' pleas went unheard. Anderson, uneasy about their fate, went to the Fox House for a better view. Artillerist E.P. Alexander, accompanying him, ran several batteries down to the river to help those two little establishments. A sharp little duel across the river ensued, but Alexander quickly found... We could do little to help our friends, because the trees and hills and ravines were so fixed that we could not see the ground. During the artillery exchange, Alexander joined Anderson in the south yard of the Fox House, away from the Federal artillery. There, Alexander sat on the sill of a closed basement window. Couriers, staffers, and their horses clustered around him. Shells began to land about promiscuously, Alexander recounted. One shell careened into one of the house's chimneys, blowing off the top ten feet of bricks. Alexander, unable to leap away because of the gaggle of people in front of him, quick as a cat, jumped on the sill instead. The recess was scarcely four inches deep, he later said, and the avalanche of bricks fell so close to me that when they were done falling, the slope of the pile completely covered my feet and ankles, which were badly bruised. One staff member was killed, and another seriously injured. I would not like to have been killed by bricks, Alexander sighed. For the South Carolinians who cringed under the artillery shells, arcing back and forth high over their heads, Hancock could not have devised a more sinister form of torture. They watched impotently as Hancock's divisions essentially deployed in full view. They seemed legion. Beyond sight to the east, Brigadier General John Gibbon's division lined up compactly on the far side of the railroad tracks. Brigadier General Francis Barlow's division lined up on the near side. Then David Belbirney's four brigades, one next to each other from east to west, Egan, Pierce, Brewster, and Mott, who were responsible for attacking the redoubt itself. Brigadier General Robert Tyler's division hung back as the reserve. The formation was so large that it overlapped the Confederate position on both ends. Mott, ordered to extend westward toward Ox Ford, was well beyond the boundaries of the fight, which fell to Birney's three other brigades. Pierce and Brewster packed their brigades together opposite the left wing of Hennigan's position. Egan, in contrast, split his brigade into two chunks. One would attack the Confederates head-on, straight down the Telegraph Road, while the other swung in against the right wing of the Confederate position. The three avenues of attack would trap Hennigan's men in a textbook pincer movement. At 6.30 p.m., the Federal advance came. The South Carolinians were quick to lash out at them. The Confederate pickets fired, then ran into their fortifications, which instantly began to smoke in jets and puffs and curls as an immense pudding, said one Federal and men in the blue-coated line fell headlong or backward or sank into little heaps. We had to run the gauntlet of the enemy's sharpshooters and artillery in the redoubt and rifle pits, extending both right and left of it, explained Lieutenant Colonel C.W. Tyler of the 141st Pennsylvania. 
That only made the men rush all the faster, said a New Yorker. We rushed down the slope and over the plain on the run, encountering as we went one of the most savage fires of shell and bullets I had ever experienced, he wrote. The weight of the three brigades against Hennigan's four regiments quickly proved too much, though. The 7th South Carolina, posted to the left of the redoubt, collapsed first. Men turned tail and ran toward the river, many of them shot in the back as they fled or tried to swim to safety. To the east of the road, the 3rd South Carolina also gave way. The collapse of both flanks cleared the way for Federals to close in on the fort itself. With what seemed a single cheer, they rushed forward. Hennigan's men had improved the fort's exterior during their short stay, adding an eight-foot moat around the outside. Attacking Federals quickly discovered how steep that wall was, which prevented them from sweeping over the ramparts uncontested. So, they improvised. Some men jammed their bayonets into the earth wall, and then, holding the butt end of the rifles, created a makeshift staircase. Other men simply heaved comrades up and over by giving them a foot up. A Confederate artillerist on the south bank of the river watched as some general officer attended by numerous staff galloped around the left of his line, seized a regimental flag, and holding it aloft, with its bright stripes gracefully swinging to the breeze, galloped straight up the earthwork and upon the embankment, and there drove the staff down into the sand. Of course, as men followed him, what else could they do? The sight was such a wonder, he admitted, that we stopped firing, took off our hats, waved them, and cheered him until he and his men were over and into the fortification. He thought it a beautiful and soldierly tribute from the gallant Americans of the South to the gallant Americans in the North, Americans all and soldiers every inch of them. The first few Federals into the fort found themselves quick targets, but soon the number of bluecoats proved overwhelming. An intense but brief fight in the redoubt quickly deteriorated into a Confederate rout. And our men scampered out of the works, ran across a bridge, and set it on fire as they were ordered to do, a Virginian noted from the South Bank. Anticipating Hancock's intentions, Confederates also torched the railroad bridge to the east. In flames, it collapsed in a steaming, smoldering heap into the river. The Confederates' attempt to burn the Chesterfield Bridge, however, was foiled. The bridge was quickly carried, Grant later recalled, the enemy retreating over it so hastily that many were shoved into the river, and some of them were drowned. Federals lay on the bank of the stream and blazed away till dark, one recalled, then moved back onto the crest of the hill and threw up some works, which we occupied the rest of the night. Several times after dark, they had to rush to the bridge's south end to defend their prize. The enemy made several attempts to burn the bridge, but were frustrated by the vigilance and good conduct of our troops, Hancock crowed. The bridge proved vital as Hancock discovered when he inspected the crossing. The river is fordable, though the banks are steep and impracticable, he wrote to headquarters, later adding that the river was a serious obstacle from the depth of the stream, the nature of its banks, and the wooded character of the country. The capture of the redoubt and the bridge was, said Hancock, very spirited and brilliant. Later he would inflate that to one of the most brilliant assaults of the war. He had no way to know at the time, but events were underway upriver that would overshadow his victory. At Hennigan's Redoubt Oxford was apparently upgraded to Oxford Road, which runs west-northwest from modern Route 1. Hennigan's Redoubt sits along Oxford Road, point two miles in on the left on private property. Please respect the property owner's rights. From the road, the earthen fortification is still visible toward the river, hulking along the far edge of the field along the tree line. Built in response to Federal cavalry raids in 1863, the original redoubt had three walls ten feet high. The backside toward the river was open. When John Hennigan's men took up position in the fort, they strengthened it by adding an eight-foot moat around the outside. 
On the eastern edge of the field, where crops end and lawn begins, the Telegraph Road's original roadbed runs down toward the river. On the north side of Oxford Road, the road trace can be clearly seen as it cuts through the forest. The field originally ran 600 yards all the way to Long Creek, on the far side of modern Route 1. Chapter 9. The Battle of Jericho Mills May 23, 1864. Afternoon, evening. If Winfield Scott Hancock looked every inch the soldier, as one admirer once claimed, then his Fifth Corps counterpart, Major General Governor Kimball Warren, looked every bit the dandy. Warren wore his hair long, coiffing it back and to the side, where it swept back up over his ears like a breaking wave. An oversized mustache, neatly trimmed, cascaded over his upper lip. Waxing the ends to points, as he sometimes did, made him verge on walrusy, but he cut a trim, crisp figure, and he carried himself with an almost aristocratic air. His eyelids hung almost half-closed, creating the impression that he was looking down his nose at whomever might be speaking to him. Best known to history as the so-called Savior of Little Round Top at the Battle of Gettysburg, Warren, the chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac, followed that performance with the temporary command of the Second Corps as Hancock recovered from a grievous Gettysburg wound. Solid performance during the Bristow campaign in the fall of 1863 marked Warren as an officer to watch. In fact, when Grant assumed command of all the armies, he pegged Warren as a possible successor to Meade. Meade, for his part, was impressed enough by Warren's performance in the fall that when he reorganized the army in the winter of 64, he rewarded Warren by promoting him to permanent command of the Fifth Corps. Warren's star began to fade almost as soon as he crossed the Rapidan in early May, however. A tame performance in the wilderness, followed by a spotty performance in Spotsylvania, had placed Warren on the brink of dismissal by May 10th. He had spent the days since playing it safe, watching his back when he wasn't watching the Confederate First and Second Corps march unmolested across his front, at any rate. Warren stirred to life, though, when Grant ordered the concentration at the North Anna. The Fifth Corps commander took point on the march down Telegraph Road, moving with admirable speed. Arriving at Carmel Church at 10 a.m. on May 23rd, he struck westward as ordered along Jericho Road to the ford at Jericho Mills. Aside from a few cavalrymen that he easily scared away, Warren found the ford undefended. The banks were steep, but the crossing good. Four feet deep, 150 feet across, and a bottom firm enough for even artillery and wagons. Bottom of the river was stony, and the stones were slippery, an infantryman later attested. This, with the swiftness of the stream, made the footing of the most active rather precarious. All things considered, Warren's chief of artillery declared the ford to be excellent. The descent on the north side is good, that on the south very sharp. Both banks are high, precipitous, and clear of trees. A Fifth Corps surgeon, noting the steep banks, added that the road down either side was very rough, being partly new corduroy, and in part a series of rocky steps and shelves caused by the irregular wearing away of the road by a small stream which flowed down its center. Warren the engineer surely saw the inherent difficulties of the position. Warren the corps commander, however, saw an opportunity. He sent word back to headquarters, inquiring whether he should cross. But rather than wait for an answer, Warren took the unusually bold move, unusual for him anyway, to ford the river and establish a presence on the south bank. I could have been over two hours sooner, but there was no one who knew the place, he informed headquarters, part boast and part complaint. 
The road from the ford ascended so steeply that Warren quickly set engineers to work cutting a new road to facilitate the movement of his artillery and wagon train. In the meantime, his infantry hauled themselves up the steep slope and, eventually, over the crest. There, they spilled out onto a plain of about 200 acres of open ground. Beyond, said artillerist Charles Wainwright, the ground was much broken with several orchards and clumps of trees. It was one thirty in the afternoon. Several miles to the east, Hancock was just muddling his way across Long Creek. Warren, in contrast, moved his corps with confidence and alacrity. Not wanting to chance that part of his command might end up isolated and vulnerable on the south bank, Warren crossed in force. Brigadier General Charles Griffin's division, in the lead, splashed across first and climbed the hill. The lead regiments deployed along a tree line at the south edge of the field, stirring up Confederate scouts in the process. That unexpected encounter led Griffin to array his entire division centered on that area. Next came Brigadier General Samuel Crawford's division, which anchored its left flank against the river a mile south of the ford and deployed in a wide arc toward the west, filling in the gap between the river and Griffin's left. Brigadier General Lysander Cutler's division came last, occupying the high ground at the north end of the plain to protect the bridgehead. Time was when the first thing to be done after a halt was to make coffee, in whose grateful fumes all weariness was forgotten, one of Crawford's weary men bemoaned. Now the first thing the men do is entrench. As soon as the Federals had deployed, they'd thrown a picket line forward into the woods south of the open plain. Soon they were trading pot shots with South Carolinian sharpshooters. The skirmishing brought the Federals into the site of Knowles Station, a small stop on the Central Virginia Railroad, where trainloads of Confederates were disembarking. The rebels were seen busy now hurrying off the trains, both railroad and wagon, a Massachusetts man observed, and in the course of an hour or two they got everything off and withdrew themselves. They would soon be back. The plain where Warren deployed sat in a large bend of the North Anna River. The river makes a wide northward swing before it arcs southwestward toward Jericho Mills. The ford crossed on the eastern bow of this wide U. Warren intended to stretch his men in a wide arc to seal off the U, with his men tucked safely inside. Yes, he had a river to his back, with tall riverbanks cutting off any other avenue of escape, but he held high open ground, and he had Horatio Wright's entire Sixth Corps moving up behind him as reinforcements. But Warren was slow to seal off his position. Griffin's 3rd Brigade, Bartlett's, lingered in the rear as a reserve, and most of Cutler's division had broken into bivouac. Finally, Cutler received orders to link up with Griffin's right and extend the westward arc. We were about camping for the night on a large open field. The regiments were forming lines to stack arms, and our headquarters had gone to the rear on a shady, grassy flat near a house, when the order came to have the brigade moved to the right farther, said Frank, a member of Colonel Edward Bragg's Pennsylvania Brigade. Color began to shift his troops, starting with one of the Army's most famed units, the Iron Brigade under Colonel William Robinson. Marching to the edge of the field, the Iron Brigade plunged into the woods to link with Griffin's right flank the brigade of Colonel Jacob B. Schweitzer. "'I experienced much difficulty, owing to the thick and tangled brush,' admitted Colonel Rufus Dawes of the 6th Wisconsin. No sooner did Dawes and the rest of the Iron Brigade slide into position than the Confederates struck. In a few moments I heard sharp musketry and the peculiar cheer of a charging column of the enemy on my right,' Dawes said." Fellow Iron Brigadier Merritt Welsh, a major in the 7th Indiana, explained, While well, forming in line, but before the troops on the right got into position, we were attacked by the enemy in overwhelming numbers and forced to retire some 200 yards. 
However, that only gave Confederates even more leverage against the Iron Brigade's shaky flank, and that in turn gave them the chance to get at the Bucktails, too, who were maneuvering into position on the Iron Brigade's right. We thought when that was done, we would rest, admitted Frank, but scarcely was the order executed when the rebels, with loud yells, poured upon our troops a heavy fire. Since sighting the Confederates along the railroad earlier in the day, Federal pickets had warned of the possibility of attack. I had feared this movement all the afternoon, swore an officer on the front lines, had impressed upon many staff officers who came to the front from brigade, division, and corps headquarters the necessity of covering it. Confederates had materialized in force. They not only hit the Federals head-on, but also slammed into the exposed right flank, flooding into the very hole in the line Warren had not yet plugged. Cadmus Wilcox listened carefully to the cavalrymen. Major General Rooney Lee, son of the Army commander who had earned a reputation as a reliable man for reconnaissance. Federals are across the river, Rooney reported. Two brigades of Federal cavalry had crossed the river at Jericho Mills. Wilcox, a major general who'd earned division command for his clear, independent thinking, sat on the far left of the Confederate line. He had not been told to expect Federal company in his sector, so Rooney's report surprised him. At least it was only cavalry, presumably on a reconnaissance mission, and not infantry, which would suggest something far more problematic. To rout them would be no great work for a division of infantry, Rooney assured. The cavalryman's report seemed to clarify the murky sightings by one of Wilcox's subordinates, Colonel Joseph Brown, whose brigade had been at Knoll Station and had seen Yankee skirmishers pop out of the woods. Brown represented the extreme left of Wilcox's line, stationed along the high ground where the railroad bed ran. Not expecting Grant to attack at North Anna, no one had given orders for Brown and his men to entrench, expecting them to have to slip eastward at some point during the night or the next day. Brown had reported the skirmish, and Wilcox came up to investigate. He brought with him three more brigades. With Brown's, the four brigades made up the 3rd Corps' vaunted Light Division, some of the most hardened marchers and fighters in an army full of them. Wilcox decided a strong push against the Federal incursion would drive them right back into the river. In preparation for his attack, he aligned his brigades along the railroad. On the right, Brigadier General James Lane's North Carolinians, then Brown, commanding the South Carolina Brigade, formerly led by Sam McGowan, then Brigadier General Edward Thomas's Georgians, and then finally Scales' brigade of North Carolinians, led now by Colonel William Lawrence. At 6 p.m., from his position along the railroad, Wilcox sallied forth to meet the Federal threat, unaware that his lone division was about to pick a fight with three full Federal divisions of infantry, the entire Union Fifth Corps. On the Federal right... Lane's Tar Heels smacked into Crawford's mixed division of Pennsylvanians, New Yorkers, and Bay Staters. Federals found themselves surprised by a sudden attack, causing some wavering. In conjunction with the assault, Confederate artillerist Lieutenant Colonel William Pegram popped out onto a piece of high ground and, in perfect synchronicity, wheeled 16 guns into formation. He and his Federal counterparts soon found themselves blasting away at each other. Our batteries in position on the north bank of the river kept up a regular storm of iron hail into them, said Sergeant Charles Thomas Bowen of the 12th U.S. Regulars. Soldiers who'd been through all the battles of the Potomac Army affirmed that they never experienced such a noisy onset, except Gettysburg, another Federal attested. The air seemed filled with the shrieking shells and whizzing fragments. The men could do more than lie down and let the storm rage. Not so for Crawford, though. The attack surprised the division commander so much that he hopped on his horse and rode off, shouting no orders and giving no commands, 
leaving his brigadiers to manage the fight on their own. They held their men firm. The sharp buzz of rifle balls around us, that bursting shell, crashing of trees, and wild yells of the rebels went to make up a very devil of a row, Bowen recalled. Give and take was the order of the day. Brown's men, meanwhile, bogged down in the woods, exposing Lane's left flank. His men began to waver, and finally the 37th North Carolina, holding the very center, broke. Lane pulled back to reform, then pushed forward again. And again, in the midst of heavy fighting, the 37th once more broke. In their initial advance, they had flushed farm animals out of the woods, including cows, chickens, and sheep. In their retreat, other North Carolinians scorned them with sheep noises. It was ludicrous in the extreme, fighting for all we were worth and bleeding like sheep, one of them later laughed. When Brown's South Carolinians finally came up, there was very heavy firing in front, said one of Griffin's men. The division commander himself joined his men at the front to urge them to stand firm. Sock it to em, boys, Griffin exulted. Because Wilcox had aligned his men along the railroad, Lane and Brown had more distance to cross to reach the federal line. To do so, they wheeled slightly left. This, in turn, pushed Thomas and Lawrence farther to their left, which put them out beyond the protected federal flank. This was the very area Robinson's Iron Brigade and Bragg's Pennsylvanians had been converging on. Units had gotten into place, but had not yet consolidated their position when Thomas smashed into them. Lawrence, even farther west, was able to wrap up and around the flank and into the open ground beyond. The Keystoners collapsed. The pioneers and clerks, exempt from going in battle or carrying arms, and drum corps rushed at once for the cover of the high pines bank, said one Pennsylvanian, noting the debris scattered in their wake. Drums, knapsacks, etc. were slung, pack mules and horses lost part of their loads. Some seemed so panic-stricken that they waded the river. One pack mule was drowned in an officer's horse. The current washed the flotsam downstream. With the rout of the bucktails, the Iron Brigade likewise melted. No brigade in the whole army had a higher reputation than the Iron Brigade, lamented one observer. Its preeminence in the old First Corps was very generally acknowledged, yet one half of it ran clear across the river without firing a shot. The half that did try to hold fast found their situation hopeless. The line on my left now abandoned their breastworks and fell back in great disorder, running through my ranks and breaking the regiment, lamented Dawes. Soon he, too, was on the run. The whole first brigade and part of the second broke most disgracefully, said artillerist Wainwright. This was a very ticklish moment. I felt that now was the time to show what artillery could do. Cadmus Wilcox bristled with pride. He was not typically one to boast, but his attack had gone handsomely, he reported to Hill. His men were advancing in good order, and the Federals were crumbling before them. The enemy would be whipped, he predicted. And so it seemed on the field of battle... Pandemonium swept through Warren's line. Bragg, panicked, cried, Save yourself! to his bucktails, and, like Crawford, galloped away. The Iron Brigade's dissolution began to eat away at Griffin's right flank. The commander, Colonel Jacob Schweitzer, tried to compensate by refusing his flank, bending it back at a right angle, in a desperate attempt to hold on, even as Thomas's Georgians swept by them. In the rear of the entire Federal position, the men of Lyle's brigade were posted in reserve where the road led down from the field to the ford. They watched as hundreds of flustered men fled rearward and splashed their way to the north bank. Pushing against this turbulent current, four artillery pieces made their way toward the front. Captain Charles E. Mink, understanding the crisis, acting under his own initiative, had mobilized his battery. 
Battery H of the 1st New York Light Artillery. I could not help a glow of pleasure and pride as I watched the four little guns moving straight through the fugitive infantry and forming on the very ground a whole brigade had abandoned, recalled Wainwright, Mink's superior. Although most of the open field was flat, several ridges rippled along its western edge. Mink's guns unlimbered along one of them and took aim. Wainwright quickly ordered two more batteries forward as additional support. All three batteries opened within canister range and did not spare the ammunition, the artillery chief said. Also looking for position was Cutler's final brigade, that of Colonel J. William Hoffman. They had been the last brigade ordered to fill the gap, but had not yet moved into position because they had been waiting for Bragg to settle in first. Hoffman held his units together, even as Bragg's men and Robinson's swarmed rearward around them. Hoffman saw Mink setting up on a ridge line a little to his rear, and so stopped his brigade's advance so they wouldn't inadvertently march out in front of their own artillery. That left Mink an open field to fire, but it cut off Hoffman's men from the thick of the fight. Thomas's advancing brigade of Georgians prepared to storm the artillery position. If the guns fell, the Confederates could drive all the way to the river and outflank the remaining pockets of Federal resistance. The broken fragments of the Fifth Corps would be swept away. However, as the Georgians rushed forward, the final Federal reinforcements on the field swept in. Brigadier General Joseph J. Bartlett's brigade of Griffin's division had been held in reserve but now plunged into the gap between Hoffman and Schweitzer's fraying line. That put Bartlett's men squarely on Thomas's flank. Forming rapidly on Schweitzer's right flank, one Federal said, We poured stunning volleys into the enemy's ranks, which, with a severe fire of grape and canister from our batteries, very much demoralized the troops. Pinned in a swale... The Georgians suffered horribly. I have seen patent mince meat cutters with knives turning in all directions, one Confederate said of the ensuing crossfire. This double angled line of fire exceeded them all. Mink continued firing case shot into them until they were driven into the woods, the artillerist later said, understating the importance of what he'd done. His action saved the Fifth Corps. The withdrawal of Thomas's men left Lawrence's exposed, so they too fell back. The rest of the Confederates, Brown's and Lane's men, had no choice but to withdraw as well. Brown, separated from his men in the retreat, ended up a prisoner. I hated to run, one Confederate said, but thought prudence the better part of valor, especially as I saw everybody else running the same way. By the time Wilcox understood the magnitude of the reversal and called Hill for support, the battle was already over. The Federals once again occupied the ground they had claimed earlier in the day, firmly ensconcing themselves on the south bank of the North Anna River. In his report to Meade, Warren downplayed the entire event at Jericho Mills. Part of my extreme right was just going into position when the enemy advanced and, receiving a considerable fire, broke, but without much loss. I had to drive them back with artillery, which made so much noise. He did admit the encounter made every part of the line feel nervous, but he never let on just how much. Wainwright, who had seen Warren up close during the fight, noted the 5th Corps commander had evidently been a good deal scared. Had they pushed their main force in on our right instead of the front, Wainwright hypothesized, it is very doubtful if the batteries could have held them. The fight at Jericho Mills had nearly ended in complete disaster for Warren. Instead, it now offered the Army of the Potomac the perfect platform for offense. I congratulate you and your gallant corps for the handsome manner in which you repulsed the enemy's attack, Meade wrote to the 5th Corps commander. He also ordered Wright's 6th Corps up as reinforcements. 
If you have an opportunity with your own core and rights to attack to advantage, Meade said, do so. With Warren across the river at Jericho Mills and Hancock across at the Chesterfield Bridge, Grant understood the advantage he now held. Lee had won the race to the North Anna River, then fumbled. Grant intended to exploit the opportunity. In a dispatch to Washington that evening, Grant showed unusual optimism. Everything looks exceedingly favorable to us. At Jericho Mills The ford at Jericho Mills, now reverting to a wilderness, is one of the most picturesque spots on all the battlegrounds of Virginia, historian Douglas Southall Freeman said in his biography of Robert E. Lee. For a century and a half, the fields and forests around Jericho Mills remained fields and forests. Conscientious stewardship by generations of landowners left the federal artillery emplacements of Mink, Matthewson, and Walcott undisturbed. The Fontaine House eventually fell into disrepair and vanished. The depression remains in the ground, surrounded by a grove of trees. Yet much remained, said Civil War Trust President James Lighthizer. The site of the original Jericho Mill, now a stately ruin, both sides of the river crossing where the pontoon bridge was constructed, the military road, multiple hastily constructed artillery lunettes still clearly visible today, the vast open plain where every musket was fired in anger on this sector of the battlefield on May 23rd. In the summer of 2014, in concert with the 150th anniversary of the Overland Campaign, The Civil War Trust, now the American Battlefield Trust, launched an effort to save all 665 acres of the battlefield, one of their largest single acquisitions ever. In all my years working to save our country's endangered Civil War battlefields, to my recollection we have never before had the opportunity to save literally an entire battlefield, especially one as important as North Anna, an entire crucial day of the Civil War at one time, Lighthizer said when announcing the campaign. At $3,140,000, the purchase price equated to about $5,000 an acre. The trust successfully closed on the property by the end of the year, but due to arrangements with the landowner, was unable to open the property to the public. The important thing, a trust spokesman said, is that the trust acquired this property to preserve in perpetuity for eventual access and interpretation. The property has since been turned over to Richmond National Battlefield for management. Chapter 10. Lee's Council of War. May 23, 1864. Evening. Dusk. Lee's inner circle looked haggard. Ewell, Anderson, Alexander, mapmaker Hotchkiss, engineer Martin Luther Smith. They and other members of their staffs had assembled at their commander's behest beneath a big lone oak tree in a field south of the Fox House. A regular little council in a 40-acre clearing, Alexander recalled. All around us, troops were going into bivouac for the night. The air was still, and it was one of those evenings when all sounds are distant and far-reaching. Lee, exhausted and cramping, sat on a root of the tree and looked at them. In the gloaming, they stood as near silhouettes against the darkening sky. What to do, Lee wondered. He had expected Grant to move farther east to the Pamunkey, but instead Grant had come right at him. What Lee had intended as a day of rest had turned into a pair of bloody noses, although the real extent of the fight at Jericho Mills remained unclear. Worse, a larger fight loomed imminent, and Lee had not prepared for it at all. What to do, what to do... Lee asked for suggestions. 
Fall back to the South Anna River, someone suggested. Or perhaps fall back as far as the Chickahominy River. Fortify along the Central Virginia Railroad embankment, suggested someone else. The Chickahominy was too close to Richmond. Lee would lose his ability to maneuver. Falling back to the South Anna River would uncover Hanover Junction, cutting Lee off from valuable supplies. Already, Warren's presence at Jericho Mills made the Central Virginia Railroad useless as a supply line, and Warren's ability to flank Confederates from that direction made the line untenable as a defense. Protecting the railroad, once Lee's main reason for falling back to Hanover Junction, was not only an impossibility now, it was a liability now that he needed to concentrate on saving his army. Lee rested with his back against the oak. He turned to his 44-year-old chief engineer, Major General Martin Luther Smith. What do you think? he asked. Smith's suggestion literally redefined the battlefield. The river, the railroads, the telegraph road, and the relative positions of the armies encouraged a linear way of thinking that Smith shattered Lee need not align the Army of Northern Virginia in a parallel line opposite the Army of the Potomac. The topography, which Smith had been studying all day, suggested diagonals. Warren and Hancock each rested on the south bank of the river, yes, but six miles and two river crossings separated them. Between them, Ox Ford offered another route across the river, but the south bank there, which the Confederates still held, was especially high. Deny Federals the ability to cross, and the separated wings of the Federal Army could not offer easy mutual support, making one, or both, ripe for isolated destruction. From the high bluffs overlooking Ox Ford, a ridgeline ran to the southwest. An old stage road ran along the ground. Hill could anchor the right flank of his corps at the ford and run it along that ridge line, eventually intersecting the railroad and anchoring beyond it on the Little River. Anderson, meanwhile, could run his corps along another ridge line from Ox Ford to the southeast toward the Telegraph Road. There, Ewell's corps could run due east and then refuse southward to protect the flank and Hanover Junction. Hill's and Anderson's position would look like an inverted V, with its apex on Ox Ford. Everyone would have strong, defensible ground to occupy, with open fields of fire in front of them. And Ewell would even have the benefit of a swamp in front of his line to help foil any Federal assault. Strong artillery platforms were available to everyone, too. Pickett and Breckinridge, newly arrived to the battlefield, would stay in the rear as reserves. They could be rushed to either flank along the railroad, which would provide a convenient and vital connection along the interior line. As it was, Hancock looked poised to advance straight toward Ewell, which would put Anderson on Hancock's flank. If he did indeed wander out there, Anderson could pin Hancock down and Ewell could swing forward like a closing door crushing Hancock. Hill, meanwhile, could fend off any assaults by Warren, who might in turn be isolated and vulnerable. Oxford was the key. Confederates had to deny Burnside or Wright any opportunity to cross. If Federals got across the river there, they would link the separated wings of the army, and any chance to destroy parts of the Army of the Potomac in detail would be lost. If I can get one more pull at him, I will defeat him, Lee said of Grant. Smith's plan would not only make good out of a bad situation, it could very well give the offensive-minded Lee the chance to get his one more pull. The old gray fox nodded his assent. As Smith later remembered the moment in a letter to his wife, I seem to have acquired the confidence of General Lee to the extent of his willingness to place his troops on the lines of my selection and stake the issue of a battle. 
more than this is hardly to be expected. As the meeting wound down and couriers began rushing away with orders, a sharp voice bit through the dark. Get around there, you damned infernal long-eared son of a jackass! It was a teamster abusing one of his mules. Lee shook his head and tried to ignore the volley of curses, but the teamster only got louder, punctuated by tremendous whacks of a lash. Lee finally stopped, then shouted in a tone which I thought would scare anybody, Alexander said. What are you beating the mule for? Is this any of your mule? The teamster replied in a mocking tone, one Alexander described as a sort of Georgia cracker wine. Everyone sat breathless. It was an awful moment, Alexander said. Not one of us dared to crack a smile. Lee shook his head again and finished, but once the council had broken up, Alexander had no doubt Lee made good his claim to the mule. A short night's sleep in the sticky summer air, the worsening dysentery that continued to dehydrate and weaken him, the mauling of his left flank by an enemy he had not expected to be there, the realization that he had grievously misjudged Grant's intentions altogether. Smith's plan allowed Lee to fortify himself against these things, too. Breakfasting the next morning with Anderson and Ewell, Lee tried to show a strong front. He asked about dispositions and, satisfied, excused himself. Ewell, whose own dysentery was getting worse, tried to hide his condition from his commander, but Lee must have noticed, feeling its effects so acutely himself, the shrewd and observant Lee certainly would have noticed its symptoms in others. Would you be up to the task ahead? Anderson, still in robust health and ever dependable, might have been better suited for the job Lee had in mind, but fate or circumstance, or simply the order of march, had placed the First Corps commander at the center of the Confederate position. He was the pinion on which the other two corps could swing. In the face of the Army of the Potomac, there was no moving now. From Hanover Junction, Lee rode west in his carriage to meet with Hill, the diminutive little Powell wearing the red shirt he typically wore into battle, greeted his commander, but after the previous night's debacle, Lee was in no mood for niceties. "'General Hill, why did you let those people cross here?' Lee growled. "'Why didn't you throw your whole force on them and drive them back as Jackson would have done?' Hill, whose temper often flared as red as his battle shirt, kept quiet. Warren had caught him off guard, and he and Lee both knew it. What remained unspoken between them, though, was the mutual knowledge that Lee had been caught off guard, too. Hill's partial culpability made him a convenient scapegoat. Still, the rebuke must have stung especially bad. Hill and Jackson had not enjoyed a friendly relationship. To be reminded that he was no Stonewall must have galled him. Add to that the unfortunate irony that Warren had bested Hill once before, in October 1863, at Bristow Station. There Hill had acted aggressively, as Jackson would have done, and Warren punished him for it. Lee did, too. So discouraged was Lee by the episode that he told Hill, let us say no more about it. Now, Lee was essentially criticizing Hill for not doing the very thing he had criticized Hill for doing almost exactly six months earlier. Hill must also have been choking on one other bit of gall. Warren, who had bested him so recently, was married to a woman Hill once seriously courted. After the disaster at Bristow, Warren had rubbed it in, sending Hill a note, I have not only whipped you, but married your old sweetheart. 
In fact, the 5th Corps commander had wasted no time in reporting to his wife the news from Jericho Mills. It was your old Bow Hill that I fought with yesterday, same as it was at Bristow, he wrote in a letter from the battlefield that morning. I think he must begin to feel unkindly toward me. With Hill squared away, Lee climbed back into his carriage and returned to his headquarters. During the ride, he had much to reflect on. The new line, the readiness of his commanders, his own illness, and Grant's intentions. All looked well, or as well as could be expected, but the morning's inspection had exhausted him. Back at headquarters, he retired to his tent to steal a little more rest while he awaited Grant's next move. Lee's Inverted V Lee hadn't expected to fight at North Anna, and as at Spotsylvania, he found himself having to adapt to the topography on the fly. The salient that resulted proved to be the strongest Confederate position yet, unlike the mule shoe at Spotsylvania, which had proven to be their weakest. Converging fire from the exterior of a salient concentrates inward against defenders, whereas the firepower of the defenders diverges outward. It fans out, making it weaker over distance. Also, if someone breaks through the line anywhere along the salient, he is then in the rear of the entire position, making it almost immediately untenable. Lee's salient at North Anna differed from the mule shoe in several significant ways, though. At Spotsylvania, the tip of the mule shoe pointed toward open fields and beyond a forest that allowed Federals to mask their approach. The tip of the position at North Anna, in contrast, rested on the high banks overlooking Ox Ford. Therefore, the approaches toward the tip of the position could not be so easily assailed. The western face of Lee's salient at Spotsylvania did not run along particularly strong ground, and the Union line came within only a couple hundred yards of it, and much of the no-man's land in between provided good topography for cover, which the Federals exploited for a May 10th attack. At North Anna, Confederates dominated a ridge that overlooked open fields, The eastern face of the position, meanwhile, could be assailed only after Federals crossed the river farther east, where they could be easily observed, and then would have to face enfilading fire from Anderson's Corps. At Spotsylvania, when Lee wanted to take advantage of his interior lines for reinforcement, he had to cross his men along indirect roads and through forests. At North Anna, the clear, straight Central Virginia Railroad offered an easy, convenient method for shifting troops if he needed to. When Lee pulled the wings of his army back into this inverted V position, he created the illusion that he was withdrawing. He then counted on Grant's aggressiveness to order the Federal Army across the river in pursuit. Thus, the Army of the Potomac would be divided in two with two river crossings and six miles of road to march over in order for those wings to support each other. Chapter 11. Mount Carmel Church. May 24th, 1864. The most elegant thing about the little brick Mount Carmel Church might have been the oak trees that stood in the front yard, stretching their boughs for shade. It was evidently of the class described by Italian cab drivers as a church for religion, not for show, one federal staff officer noted. Another said the church looked precisely like a town hall where people are coming to vote, only the people had unaccountably put on very dusty uniforms. As Grant, Meade, and their staffs rode in along the Bowling Green Road from the east, they stopped the church, which sat at the intersection of the north-south running Telegraph Road. Westward ran the Jericho Mill Road that Warren and Wright had taken the day before. If you want a horrible hole for a halt, just pick out a Virginia church at a Virginia crossroads after the bulk of an army has passed on a hot, dusty Virginia day said staffer Theodore Lyman. 
A most hot, dry, dusty, and barren corner it was, where we boiled in a semi-idiotic state for hours. It was 6.30 a.m., just two and a half miles to the south. The Army of the Potomac was getting its first look at Lee's reconfigured lines. Although no one had any real, clear idea of what they were seeing... Only the Ninth Corps ran into any opposition as it tried to get across the river at Ox Ford. An ominous sign for the day ahead, although no one on the north side of the river yet knew it. Inside the church, staffers laid boards across the broad aisle to make a table, where Grant, Meade, and the others soon busied themselves. Spirits generally ran high, but the growing tension between the generals boiled over anew, when a pair of Grant's cronies stoked the fire. The first was Sherman, interjecting via ciphered dispatch to update Grant on his latest success in Georgia. Sherman's message was one of the florid style in which he occasionally indulges, Lyman groused, wherein he said that the Army of the West had fought enough to be entitled now to maneuver, and that if Grant could inspire the Potomac Army to do a proper degree of fighting, the final success could not be doubted. Meade's gray eyes grew like a rattlesnake's as he heard the dispatch read aloud. The man whose volcanic temper had earned him the nickname Goddamn Goggle-Eyed Snapping Turtle erupted. Sir, Meade barked. I consider that dispatch an insult to the army I command and to me personally. The Army of the Potomac does not require General Grant's inspiration or anybody else's inspiration to make it fight. Meade did not let the slight pass easily, either. At dinner, he spoke of the Western troops as an armed rabble. Adding injury to Sherman's insult was the return of long-absent cavalry chief Phil Sheridan, another of Grant's closest cronies, who rode into headquarters late in the day. Well bronzed after his two-week jaunt in the saddle, the bandy-legged Irishman was warmly greeted and heartily congratulated upon his signal success. After beating the Confederate cavalry and mortally wounding their commander, Jeb Stuart, Sheridan's gusto was up, and he briefly considered a raid on Richmond. The capital's formidable defenses quickly deflated that idea, so instead he and his troopers met up with Major General Benjamin Butler's Army of the James, stalled in its own campaign southeast of Richmond. After resupplying, Sheridan's men tried to make their way back north, but they were dogged by the remains of Stuart's cavalry and delayed by the same rains that hampered the armies at Spotsylvania. Muddied roads and swollen rivers significantly delayed their return. In describing a particularly hot fight, Sheridan would become highly animated in manner and dramatic gesture, recounted Porter. Then he would turn to some ludicrous incident, laugh heartily, and seem to enjoy greatly the recollection of it. Porter generously described this as becoming modesty, but it was classic self-promoting Sheridan. Grant, for his part, enjoyed the show. Now Sheridan evidently thinks he's been clear down to the James River and has been breaking up railroads and even getting a peep at Richmond, the commander said. But probably this is all imagination, or else he's been reading something of the kind in the newspapers. I don't suppose he seriously thinks that he made such a march as that in two weeks. Well, Sheridan replied, after what General Grant says, I do begin to feel doubtful as to whether I have been absent at all from the Army of the Potomac. Meade must have fumed. His army had been left blind and deaf by Sheridan's egotism, which in turn had cost the lives of thousands of infantrymen. Yet Sheridan received a hero's welcome as the man who'd killed Jeb Stuart, as though that somehow gave the cavalrymen a free pass for his otherwise categorical failure. Days later, on their way to the Pamunkey River, the commanders would get a hint of the serious trouble Sheridan had run into on his expedition, following a road toward Richmond strewn with the dead horses from Sheridan's returning column. There was a horse every few rods, and the air was tainted with them. Sheridan's expedition, they would realize, had not been all glory after all. 
If Meade felt testy about the situation with Grant, Grant seemed to let it roll, as he did with so much else. In fact, on May 24th, he underscored his continued confidence in Meade by shuffling his command structure, increasing Meade's responsibilities. When Grant had brought Ambrose Burnside east in the spring, he had not incorporated the Ninth Corps into the Army of the Potomac because Burnside outranked Meade, which would have violated Army protocol and tradition. Therefore, Burnside's Ninth Corps had been acting as an independent command, answering directly to Grant, just as Meade was. Once in the field, though, the arrangement became immediately cumbersome. Grant had to issue separate sets of orders to Meade and to Burnside, and the bureaucratic hoops made it hard for them to keep in sync. Ostensibly, Grant aimed to fix this awkwardness, but there might have been more at work under the surface as well. Burnside's performance thus far during the Overland campaign had been tepid at best. The inferiority of the Ninth Corps begins now to show a good deal, intimated Lyman, who complained about the Corps' straggling and the general comparative want of tone and discipline. Grant's solution was to assign Burnside to the Army of the Potomac. That order is excellent, a magnanimous Burnside reportedly responded. It is a military necessity, and I am glad it has been issued. But beneath his jovial surface, Burnside must have felt at least a little stung by the new arrangement. After all, he had once commanded this very army when it was 123,000 men strong, and Meade had served under him as a mere division commander. How far he had fallen in the 17 months since. That the order announcing the new arrangement came when it did, one day after Burnside's 40th birthday, must have made it smart all the more. The manner in which Burnside acquiesced, and the spirit he manifested in his readiness to set aside all personal aims and ambitions for the public good, were among the many instances of his patriotism and his absolute loyalty to the cause he served, said one officer. Before the close of the day, though, Burnside would have plenty of other problems to worry about, too. At Carmel Church Organized in 1773, Carmel Church was situated at the intersection of Telegraph Road and the fork of the Milford, Bowling Green, and Chilesburg Roads because of the very desirable location. Originally called Polecat Church after a nearby stream, congregants changed the name to Burris's Church in honor of the first pastor. The name evolved to Burris's Baptist Church of Christ at Mount Carmel, which eventually shortened to Mount Carmel. A formal vote of the congregation later dropped the mount. The original building was replaced by a newer structure on the same site in 1838. That building burned in 1874 and was replaced by a brick structure. The church has added on several times since. According to church records, the church also needed some repair work after Grant Meade and their entourages stopped over. Federal troops riddled the church inside and turned it into a slaughter pen, says the history. After the war, according to Wingfield's History of Caroline County, Virginia, in the late 60s, colored deacons were ordained, and that in 1868, Elmore E. Taylor was granted a license to preach the gospel to persons of his own color. When the original church burned in 1874, the African-American members of the congregation who outnumbered the white members three to one at times, split away to build their own church. Chapter 12. Marching into the Trap May 24th, 1864. Morning. On the front line, May 24th had slowly swelled to wakefulness. The air, already saturated with humidity and tension, felt like a slow cooker, the kind of pressure only a storm could relieve. The sun rose like a disk of molten brass, presaging a day of terrible heat, making us long for shelter from its rays, a New Yorker said. But it was not long before we were to wish for shelter from something hotter yet. Federal soldiers were unsure of what waited ahead of them. Coiled taut overnight, 
They watched as Don sketched the landscape, then gave it detail, then gave it color. Nothing. Hancock's small lodgment on the south end of Chesterfield Bridge saw nothing. Warren's fifth corps, planted on the high ground above Jericho Mills, saw nothing. My skirmishers are pushing out and find no enemy so far, Warren wrote at 6 a.m. I shall keep feeling out till I develop the enemy's position, if he is still around. But it was as though the Confederates had vanished. This morning we found that the enemy had fallen back somewhat from our front, artillerist Charles Wainwright wrote. The Second Corps also found their front free this morning, so that they crossed without opposition. Per orders from Grant the night before, Hancock started the day by consolidating his grip on the south bank. At several places, his men felled trees across the river and clambered across in single file, then up the far bank. He also sent men straight across the bridge. I've seen nothing in my front but a few scattering of men, said Division Commander John Gibbon from the south side of the river. Pushing forward from there, Hancock reported a little later that Confederates show no force except sharpshooters in their works, but there is a skirmish line at the edge of the woods behind. Upriver, Warren's men, too, pushed farther forward. Soldiers, traversing the field of the previous day's battle, noted, The trees were rent and torn by shot and shell. The ground up to the felled trees in our front was strewn with guns, belts, and all sorts of trash together with the dead bodies of many graybacks. They could everywhere see pools of blood, shreds of bloody clothing, and so. By mid-morning, he had found no enemy yet. At about that time, though, the enemy found Hancock. The Second Corps' advance took it across Anderson's front, a mile away to their west. Anderson opened with his artillery. Gibbon complained of fire annoying me from his right, from what should have been Burnside's front. He had also advanced far enough to discover Confederates were there after all, right well thrown back. Warren advanced far enough to still find nothing. His path took him across the face of Hill's line, but not into it, so he assumed the Confederates had pulled up. So confident was he in his assessment that by one o'clock, Meade directed him to stretch out on a road to the South Anna River, with an eye toward crossing the next day. Wright was ordered to follow in line. The farther Warren and Hancock advanced, the farther apart the two wings of the army became, wedged away from each other, unbeknownst to them, by Lee's inverted V. The first man to get an accurate picture of the Confederate position was the man who first ran into it, Ninth Corps Commander Ambrose Burnside. Hancock is directed to effect the crossing, Grant had explained to him the night before, and has been authorized to call on you for such assistance as he may require. You will, therefore, if called on by him, send all the assistance he may ask for. If Grant didn't need him, though, Burnside was to effect a crossing of his own at Oxford, roughly midway between Chesterfield Bridge and Jericho Mills. Once there, Burnside got a good look at what he faced. The enemy's side of the river is densely wooded along its bank, with high ground in rear, with one battery in position flanked by rifle pits, and it is reported that there is another line of rifle pits in front. Orders were orders, though, and, as was Burnside's nature, he managed to sound cheerfully equivocal about it. The prospects of success are not all that flattering, he opined, but I think the attempt can be made without any very disastrous results, and we may possibly succeed. Left unsaid, we may possibly not. And they didn't. Confederates repulsed several attempts to cross, the ford is very rough and deep, Burnside tried to explain, and a considerable portion of the men fall in crossing, thus spoiling their ammunition. Grant, ensconced at Carmel Church, pushed him on. You must get over and camp tonight on the south side, one of Grant's aides wrote peremptorily. 
but Oxford was a non-starter. Above and behind the Ford, Lane's Georgia batteries lobbed long-range harassment at Hancock's Second Corps. Hancock finally sent part of Colonel Nelson A. Miles's brigade forward to silence the guns. As the men advanced, Anderson's infantry easily batted them away. As Miles stubbornly kept trying, his men discovered something Martin Luther Smith had known the evening before when he laid out the Confederate line. The plane, a mile wide, was frighteningly, frighteningly open. Nothing but the inequalities of the surface furnished us any protection from the fire we drew, and we were compelled to lie prone and hug the ground under a hot sun and a hot musketry fire, a Federal said. Hancock sent to Burnside for help, expecting the Ninth Corps commander to clear the Confederates away by securing Ox Ford, which, unbeknownst to him, Burnside still could not cross. To his credit, Burnside chose to improvise. Sending a division to Hancock's relief, Burnside decided to try and outflank Ox Ford by circling around in the other direction as well. Quarles Mill, a ford slightly upriver from Ox Ford, provided an ideal crossing. With Potter's division closing in with Hancock's men from the left and Crittenden's closing in from the right, Wilcox's division would try, once more, to assault from the front. A similar pincer movement by Hancock had driven Confederates out of the redoubt the day before, so Burnside hoped to achieve similar results now. To the west, as Warren slowly felt his way forward, he'd sent part of Crawford's division eastward toward Oxford to open a line with Burnside. By noon, Grant ordered the rest of Crawford to move in support of Burnside's pincer movement. At first, the news seemed good, and Warren reported that Crawford had captured the Ford. But the news was premature, and suddenly, communication from Crawford ceased. That shows that somebody is still about, Warren said ominously. The 5th Corps commander found his own somebodies soon thereafter. Found enemy about three to four miles off down the river, he reported. Hancock, too, began to get a clearer picture of what was in front of him as the skirmishing continued. Ewell to his front, Anderson on his right. The enemy are in strong force, he finally admitted by 5 p.m. Hancock's left flank became briskly engaged, the brunt of the affair falling on Colonel Thomas Smythe's brigade. After Smythe captured the initial works, he afterwards was furiously assaulted, but with reinforcements, held his line in the midst of a furious rainstorm. Hancock thought to launch Barlow's division against the Confederates to relieve the pressure. But the enemy's line was found, on examination, to be so strong and carefully protected by heavy works in Abbottee that the projected assault was abandoned, he said. Hancock soon began to worry about his left rear and asked for cavalry to guard it. He knew the reputation of the Confederate Second Corps as Lee's most infamous flankers. More worrisome was the fact that Miles, even reinforced by the division from Burnside, had not come close to budging Anderson or silencing the guns, which still controlled Chesterfield Bridge, Hancock's only route of retreat. While we lay in the woods said a member of the Ninth Corps Division sent to reinforce Miles. The clouds, which in the morning looked dark and portentous, assumed a darker hue, and in a short time the rain fell in torrents. The blinding flashes of lightning joined with the deep rumble of thunder produced a scene of gloom, if not terror. The downpour was so intense, said a New Yorker, that it completely veiled the contending forces from each other although they had been but a few rods apart on an open field where they had been dealing and receiving heavy blows. As it grew dark, the firing ceased, a Federal said, and it now seemed as if the powers on high alone were in contention. Even before the blood stopped flowing, one soldier said, 
Combatants settled into rain-drenched detente. It is impossible to suppose that Lee did not appreciate his advantages, one of Grant's aides later wrote. He now had one of those opportunities that occur but rarely in war, but which, in the grasp of a master, make or mar the fortunes of armies and decide the result of campaigns. On the South Bank On the south end of the modern Route 1 bridge, along the northbound side of the road, a boat landing provides a convenient spot to park and explore the riverbank terrain. Here, the north bank dominates the south bank, which aided Federals in their attempts to secure a crossing. In other places, such as Oxford, the south bank dominates. The construction of the modern road, bridge, and boat landing minimizes the effect of the topography along the river, though. The North Anna served as an especially formidable geographic feature because of its high, steep banks, which dozens of soldiers commented on in their accounts. Throughout the war, Army commanders used rivers as shields to protect them as they maneuvered, defensible positions to hole up behind, barriers to protect their flanks, and avenues of supply. An army crossing a river was particularly vulnerable because crossings bottlenecked an army and took time to complete. An army partially over a river was isolated and vulnerable, and suddenly rising waters from unseen rains upstream could cause unexpected fluctuations in water level. A few hundred yards east of the boat landing, the modern railroad spans the river. Next to the line stand bridge abutments from the old Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad. Confederates successfully torched the railroad bridge in their defense of the river crossing. Beyond the abutments, past a truck turnaround on private property, a double line of earthworks hastily thrown up by Confederates runs along the river. At the far end of the works, the remains of a road trace bisect the works. This is the remnant of the road trace Federal engineers cut when they constructed a pontoon bridge for crossing. On the west side of Route 1, a state historical marker commemorates the passage of the Marquis de Lafayette through the area on May 30, 1781. Lord Cornwallis pursued to the banks of the North Anna the following day. Nearby, a granite monument marks U.S. Route 1 as Jefferson Davis Memorial Highway. There is a marker on the bridge itself as well, a concrete obelisk with a plaque that marks the crossing as the place where Lee checked the Army of the Potomac commanded by Ulysses S. Grant. The marker also describes it as a crisis in the war between the states. A couple hundred yards along the southbound lane, to the west of the road, the Fox House, Ellington, sits behind a protective screen of noise-reducing trees. Built in the mid-1930s, the two-story brick house exemplified Georgian-style architecture. That is, the front and back and left and right sides of the house mirrored each other. The house today faces Route 1, but at the time of the war, the Telegraph Road ran on the back side of the house. The east-facing orientation of the house then, according to local historian John Cummings, was to take advantage of the morning sun in the winter to help warm the house faster. The chimneys, subjected to federal artillery fire, which rained bricks down upon E.P. Alexander, can still be seen closest to the road on the south side of the house. Damage from the cannonball that nearly hit Lee remains visible in the front door frame. A small brick building next to the main house once served as Reverend Thomas Fox's schoolhouse. On May 24, 1864, after the Second Corps had crossed the river and run into the Confederates, Hancock's men fell back and threw up lines of works to protect themselves. One of the lines, wrote John Haley of the 17th Maine, took under its protection the house of a divine who must be a person of culture and means that is, Reverend Fox. By the time Haley arrived on the property, Fox had left his home deserted. He and his family had found that his duty lay in another direction, and at the first gunshot had left precipitately, Haley noted. Inspecting the property gave Haley and his compatriots a decidedly negative view of the Reverend. 
This man of God has not been slow in securing a share of the world's goods. He probably has more business capacity than faith. His effects were all there in the house, and we could pick out such as suited our needs. I fell in love with a choice bit of china plate, and a union was effected in a few seconds without benefit of clergy. It is keeping with our mission to destroy this kind of theology as quickly as possible, a theology that sanctions slavery save us too strongly of Satan to be tolerated. The religion of Jesus Christ has nothing in common with the auction block or the lash. In 2019, the American Battlefield Trust saved the Fox House and adjacent 123 acres of property, including the ruins of the Chesterfield Bridge, and the house was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. As of this recording, however, the property is not yet accessible to the public. Chapter 13 The Battle of Ox Ford May 24th, 1864. Afternoon, evening. "'Have you heard anything from Crawford?' Meade asked Warren about his fellow Pennsylvanian. It was two o'clock in the afternoon on May 24th. The expedition Warren had sent to clear the way to Oxford had remained silent throughout the afternoon. Unbeknownst to the Corps or Army commander, Crawford's men had been bottled up at Quarles Mill by Confederate sharpshooters. Relief finally arrived when the lead brigade of Crittenden's Ninth Corps Division arrived. Brigadier General James Ledley, a walrus-mustached man with a high peaked forehead and cupidal curls, jovially splashed his men across the ford. A political appointee, Ledley was rash and reckless, full of dash and bluster and, as it would turn out, booze. The water was so deep in places, a Massachusetts man recounted, that the men had to throw their cartridge boxes across their shoulders to keep their ammunition from getting wet. It was slow work, floundering over the slippery rocks and through the whirling eddies. Ledley gave his men time to empty water from their shoes and wring out their socks, then he wheeled his men eastward and set off for Oxford. Spotting the Confederate works, Ledley wanted to pitch in immediately, even though he saw how formidable the opposing line was. "'Send me additional regiments,' Ledley blustered in a message to Crittenden, "'and I will charge and capture it.' Crittenden said no. "'Tell him that I have information that seems reliable, "'that the enemy is posted in force in his front,' Crittenden told him. "'And if he charges, I am afraid it will be a failure "'and result in bringing on a serious engagement "'which we are in no condition to meet now.' as a large part of my division is still on the other side of the river. Tell him to use the utmost caution. Ledley, seeing glory through whiskey-colored lenses, was in an excited state of mind, gesticulating frantically. It is doubtful if he heard, or if he did, that he understood one word or cared, lamented the courier, Captain John Anderson, Inspire in bold John Barleycorn. What dangers canst thou make us scorn? He added. Ledley's entire staff seemed swept up in the bacchanalia. One officer stood in front of the Federal position, waving his Smith and Wesson and firing aimlessly at the Confederates. Another, drunk and sunstroked, was carried away on a stretcher. An engineer topped the tip of his sword with his hat and waved it around, hooping and dancing. A sharpshooter responded by putting a bullet through the hat. "'Come on, Yank!' a Confederate cried to them. "'Come on to Richmond!' Ledley soon took the Reb up on the offer. Despite Crittenden's orders and no reinforcements, he launched his attack. Major General William Little Billy Mahone was a small, wiry man with a long, sagebrush beard. An engineer before the war, he had worked his way up to division command through solid performances and heavy attrition among the late officers above him. With the advantage of a strong ridgeline as a starting point, his men spent hours fortifying, creating some of the most formidable earthworks yet in the campaign. Edward Perry's Floridians and Nathaniel Harris's Mississippians anchored the line on the heights above the ford. 
From there, the line extended along the old stage road all the way back to the Central Virginia Railroad and beyond. The rest of Little Billy's brigades filled in next to Harris, and Wilcox's division, still smarting from its rough handling the night before, filled in to the railroad. Henry Heath's division formed the final link between the railroad and the Little River. Artillery fronted the river, dominating Oxford below, and the Chesterfield Bridge a mile to the east. Mahone also had several batteries facing the plain that Ledley was now crossing. Black lowering clouds had gathered, a soldier said, and were fast approaching from the west. A heavy shower was coming, and as Ledley's men advanced, the sky let loose. A noise like the coming of a cyclone of a herd of steers reached our ears, said a member of the 2nd Georgia Battalion, posted in a ravine on Ledley's flank where they'd been posted to guard the fords. We were ordered forward, and some places a difficult thing to do, as the face of the ravine was almost perpendicular. But by dint of perseverance we were finally mustered, tired and out of breath, upon the plateau above. There... They opened on Ledley's unsuspecting flank. Torrents of rain washed across the field, and lightning whipped the sky. Thunder boomed, but the Confederate artillery remained ominously silent. Suddenly every gun flashed out a shower of grape and canister, which shook the very ground and swept everything in front, a Federal said. The gallant charge went no farther, but turned into a complete rout. Federals collapsed into a confused and demoralized flight. Even Ledley's two regiments of U.S. regulars, the 4th and the 10th, run like sheep. Under such lack of direction, said one soldier, every man became his own general. Seeing the collapse, Mahone sent the 12th Mississippi and the 8th and 11th Alabama out of the works in a sharp counterattack. The Mississippians flushed into the Federal left, the Alabamians into the Federal right, a miniature version of the very pincer movement Burnside had envisioned. A tremendous volley, followed by the unmistakable rebel yell, told us plain enough that the Mississippians had struck the Yanks, said one of the Georgians who'd earlier hit the Federal flank. And as the yelling and the firing came toward us, it was evident enough that the Yanks were on the run. One of the Mississippians, running past, seemed delighted to be giving it to the Federals so badly. "'Bang it, boys!' he called. "'But ain't we making them think it's Christmas, though!' Ledley made no attempt to rally his men, but several regimental officers tried. Colonel Stephen Weld of the 56th Massachusetts and Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Chandler of the 57th Massachusetts both took bullets. Weld survived, but Chandler had his arm torn off at the elbow. His men tried to rush him from the field, but he urged them to put him down. "'You can do nothing for me,' he said. "'Save yourselves if you can.' The rout sent Ledley's men all the way back to the river. Looking down into the deep black waters in rear, and the charging enemy in front— presented a rather gloomy appearance to a defeated, demoralized body of men without head or guidance, admitted one of the fleeing men. Now it was turned for Crawford's men to offer relief to Ledley's. Together with other elements of Crittenden's division, they all hunkered down against the river and fortified. "'General Crittenden has had quite a sharp fight and met with quite a loss,' Burnside wrote to headquarters a little while later." I feel quite anxious about their position. Had he been camped on the south bank as Grant had ordered him to several times, perhaps he'd have been less anxious. But Lee's inverted V had stymied his every attempt. Nothing whatsoever was accomplished, lamented Captain Anderson, except a needless slaughter. Incredibly, James Ledley was not fired for his ineptness. Rather, when Crittenden stepped down from division command in early June, Ledley was promoted to take his place. Ledley's incompetence finally caught up with him in late July, but with a terrible price for his men. At Petersburg, 
Federal troops dug a mine beneath the Confederate lines and blew it up. Ledley's men, ordered to exploit the breakthrough, rushed into battle and found themselves trapped in the massive crater where many of them were slaughtered. Ledley, meanwhile, hid behind a bunker behind the lines and got drunk. The resulting court of inquiry effectively drummed him out of the army. It has long been a matter of mental debate whether the truth in regard to this affair should be told or not, said John Anderson of the 57th Massachusetts Infantry. Whether, as long as there is no remedy for it now, it should not be smoothed over and made to appear in a favorable light. But justice to the memory of those brave men who fell upon that bloody field, and our own sense of duty, prompts us to tell the truth as we saw it. At North Anna Battlefield Park Billed as the largest Civil War battlefield park not operated by the National Park Service, the North Anna Battlefield Park represents the best of all win-win preservation scenarios. A local quarry owned the land, but rather than mine the property, it worked with Hanover County to preserve and develop it into a battlefield park, which opened in 1996, complete with gravel trails and interpretive wayside panels. Initially preserving 80 acres, the park now encompasses 172 acres and includes six miles of trails. On May 24, 2014, Hanover County dedicated the expanded park in conjunction with the sesquicentennial anniversary of the battle. The park's original trail, labeled the Gray Trail, consists of ten stops and runs just over two miles round trip. It follows along the interior of A.P. Hill's portion of the Confederate line. North Anna features some of the best preserved earthworks anywhere. Please ensure they stay in pristine condition by not climbing on or in them. The trail extends all the way to the Confederate positions that overlook Ox Ford. For much of the way, the trail follows the original roadbed of the carriage road that came up from the ford. Near its northernmost end, the roadbed splits away and curves down to the river. Near the bank, a line of advanced Confederate works still runs along the base of the heights on both sides of the road. Above, the trail ends at a platform overlooking the North Anna, providing an optimal perspective for understanding just how dominating the Confederate position was. The trail also branches away for a short jaunt to the Confederate artillery positions that harassed Hancock's men so mercilessly. Some 3,000 rounds of counter-battery fire tried to dislodge the Confederate cannoneers in vain. A second trail... The Blue Trail, opened in 2014 in conjunction with the sesquicentennial anniversary of the battle. It branches away from the Gray Trail and extends 1.4 miles. It follows the retreat of Ledley's men after their attack disintegrated, and they fell pell-mell back to the rear. It also covers some of the skirmishing on May 25th. Of particular note are the Federal earthworks at the far end of the trail. Following the Blue Trail can be particularly difficult, though. The terrain runs riot, with roller coaster like swells and dips that generally run perpendicular to the river. Chapter 14 Strike Them a Blow May 24, 1864 Sick as a dog and cross as an old bear, Lee had returned from his morning inspection of the line and retired to his tent. As Federals had fanned cautiously southward, Confederate eyes followed their progress and reported back to headquarters. As Federals bumped unsuspecting into the V, Lee could hear the ensuing firefights. Everything was falling into place, exactly as Smith had planned and Lee had hoped. As Warren and Hancock each advanced, the Confederate wedge divided and isolated them more and more. Though he still had reports of the operations in the field constantly brought to him, and gave orders to his officers, Lee, confined to his tent, was not Lee on the battlefield, observed his aide, Charles Venable. Exhausted, Lee could not come forth and supervise for himself. 
Lee could attend to nothing except what was absolutely necessary for him to know or act upon. Colonel Walter Taylor, Venable's counterpart on the staff, later explained. Taylor himself felt crushed by the weight of the grind. Waked out of sleep every half hour almost. By morning I am so stupid and heavy that it is difficult to make me recover my wits. The anxiety lest I should overlook something or commit some serious blunder tells upon me more than the fatigue or loss of rest. By afternoon, the dysentery finally tightened its grip, sending Lee into a fever. Suppose disease should disable him, or worse, should take him forever from the front of his men. His son, Captain Robert E. Lee Jr., worried. It was too awful to consider. Lee lay prostrate on his cot, half delirious. We must strike them a blow, he called. We must strike them a blow. But he had no one who could strike. Perhaps he had thought he could fight through his illness and direct events himself and so had not felt the need to develop a succession plan. Perhaps he had not felt comfortable enough with his subordinates to entrust them with one. Ewell, sick and erratic, Hill, shamed and undependable, Anderson, untested and anchoring the entire position. Jackson and Longstreet, long his hammer and anvil, were gone. Lee had also lost Jeb Stewart at the Corps level. At the division and brigade levels, he'd lost another 14 commanders, a bleeding-out process that really had begun in earnest at Chancellorsville a year before. On May 6th at the Wilderness, Lee had tried to avert crisis by leading troops into battle. Soldiers refused to go, crying, Lee to the rear! Lee to the rear! Similar circumstances arose at Spotsylvania on May 10th, and then repeated themselves on May 12th. Lee, trying to staunch holes in his line, was turned back by his own men, who recognized a truth well before Lee himself did. Robert E. Lee, the indispensable man of the Confederacy, was irreplaceable. As he writhed on his cot, calling out, there was no one to answer his call to action. There was no one to take his place. There was no one to strike the blow. If General Lee had known the true condition of affairs at this point on the south bank of the river, there's little doubt but he would have made the attack, Massachusetts Captain John Anderson wrote years later. With the two wings of the Federal Army so widely separated, succor could not have been obtained in time to avert a still greater disaster than the one already experienced. Lee's opportunity existed only as long as Grant remained ignorant about his true danger. The day-long skirmishing and the evening fighting had been slow to reveal the picture to Grant, but finally he and Meade understood what they faced. Six miles separated one wing of the divided army from the other. To get from one wing to the other, Grant realized, the river would have to be crossed twice. The army was, for all practical intents, two separate besieging armies. Meanwhile, Grant knew Lee could reinforce any part of his line from all points of it wherever he might choose to assault. He also finally heard news of the arrival of Pickett, Hoke, and Breckinridge. In all probability, not less than 15,000 men, he later estimated. With urgency, Grant and Meade reacted to protect the army. Entrench your present position and hold it against the enemy, Meade told Hancock. To the west, Warren dug in parallel to Hill's line and waited, both foes expecting attack orders that never came. The chance to strike a blow had passed. The armies settled into stalemate. Chapter 15 Stalemate through the 26th, 1863. The 28th Massachusetts had spent all day on May 24th lying in an open field exposed to artillery fire and the blistering sun, without shelter. 
That night, and into the wee hours of the next morning, they lay on their arms in a drenching rain. The men suffered much, said Captain James Fleming, having had no rest for the past three days, and their rations having run short, long marches, constant duty, and the officers sharing alike with them in the fatigue, exposure, and short rations. They would remain short of rations for two more days, watching as trains and cattle which had crossed to the south side are recrossed only aggravated their hunger. So passed the days for the two armies. We fully expected to receive one of Grant's interesting 4 a.m. calls, wrote artillerist E.P. Alexander on May 25th, but he did not come. Neither this morning nor any other morning, as long as we held those lines. It was decidedly another case of our making them too good. They wanted to attack us. They crossed the river for that purpose, and for that they built themselves a strong line, about 800 yards from ours, to fall back to if defeated. And their engineers and their generals looked at our beautiful lines with long eyes for several days but they always shook their heads and said it would not do. Alexander's Union counterpart, Charles Wainwright, came to a similar conclusion. Grant finds the enemy too strongly posted to allow us any chance of carrying the works, and Lee appears inclined to act entirely on the defensive, he said. During a railroad wrecking detail that day, Wainwright caught a good view of the rebel line, which is strong, much better laid out and heavier than ours, as they always are. Grant, often criticized unjustly in the intervening years for making headlong attacks, recognized the madness of trying one against Lee's inverted V. To make a direct attack from either wing would cause a slaughter of our men that even success would not justify, the commanding general wrote. The armies took pot shots at each other throughout the 25th, the usual skirmishing and artillery firing, one Union officer said, but neither made any real move at the other. Warren contented himself with tearing up the Central Virginia Railroad to his west. The men labored earnestly and cheerfully all day, said one of Warren's officers, and made very thorough destruction of all the rails and sleeps. Hancock's men dismantled the remains of the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad Bridge, and tore up tracks on both sides of the river. The rails and ties were torn up, heaps made of the ties upon which were laid the rails, and the heaps fired, one of them wrote. The rails, when heated red, were seized by the men and twisted around trees like neckties, rendering them more ornamental than useful. Yet, it all somehow felt like busy work. Unless the Rebs commit some great error, a Union officer sighed, they hold us in check until kingdom come. The stalemate continued into May 26th. It's raining hard and the men in the trenches are suffering very much, rude one Confederate. In a letter written to his wife that day, their anniversary... Richard Ewell complained of being a little unwell, not connected at all with my leg, but bad diet. The dysentery that had haunted him had finally struck in full force as it had when it incapacitated Lee two days earlier. Lee, still weak, was at least back on his feet, but Ewell was sinking lower. We are still in juxtaposition with the Yankees, mutually watching. Ewell added in his letter, They entrenched so strongly as to make it impossible to attack any part of their lines on this flank, while they are equally afraid to come at us. This will probably continue until they take advantage of darkness to pass across our flank when we will be forced to move again to get in their front. We are getting too near Richmond for this to continue much more and one side or the other will have to change tactics and go at it hammer and tongs. Within days, Ewell would be in Richmond himself, sent there to convalesce. Lee would replace him at the head of the Second Corps with Major General Jubal Early. 
When Ewell recovered enough weeks later to return to the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee instead had him reassigned, under Ewell's protests, to command the defenses around the capital. Lee's faith in Old Baldy had been damaged beyond repair. Ewell would be perhaps the most notorious casualty of the battle, albeit collaterally. Specific casualties for this third phase of the campaign remain sketchy, but the best estimate puts figures at some 2,017 Confederate losses. 304 killed, 1,513 wounded, and 200 captured. And some 2,623 Federals. 1,973 killed, wounded, and missing, plus another 650 sick. Following, as it did, the fiery nightmare in the wilderness and the grueling slaughter of Spotsylvania, and preceding the stunningly futile charges at Cold Harbor, it's little wonder that the North Anna has been the least remembered phase of the Overland Campaign. Yet it was here on the banks of the river, in the actions of the commanders and in the morale of the armies, where the wars of attrition and annihilation finally made themselves apparent. Early on May 25th, Lee received a disheartening bit of news that suggested the fight would go on. During Ledley's foolhardy attack on May 24th, one of his aides had been captured carrying a dispatch from Grant to Burnside. The contents must have made the ailing Lee sicker to his stomach than he already was. I understand that all the forts and posts have been stripped of their garrisons, and every available man has been brought to the front, Lee wrote to Jefferson Davis. This makes it necessary for us to do likewise. The killing and the dying was not yet done. We lay for three days in the trenches at North Anna, moaned Private Frank Wilkeson, an artillerist from New York. Three days of woe and sorrow and hardship. Once more, Grant realized he needed to give up the ghost. We could do nothing where we were unless Lee would assume the offensive, he later explained. I determined, therefore, to draw out of our present position and make one more effort to get between him and Richmond. Grant opted for another movement left and south. Meade, who had advocated for such a move all along, must have felt gratified. Ever the professional, though, he refrained from offering the general-in-chief an I told you so. Not everyone under Grant's command felt such satisfaction. Could it be that this is the sum of our lieutenant general's abilities? asked Wainwright. Has he no other resource in tactics, or is it sheer obstinacy? Three times he has tried this move around Lee's right, and three times has been foiled. His dispatch sounds very well. I mean to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. But officers and men are getting tired of it, and would like a little variety on night marches and indiscriminate attack on earthworks in the daytime. There must be a continuous line of entrenchments now all the way from here to the Rapidan, or half a dozen lines, rather, and if we keep on, they will by and by join onto the works around Richmond. Neither of our two commanding generals seem to be smart enough to do anything beyond mediocrity, another federal officer grumbled. We're all getting thoroughly tired and disgusted. These two armies remind me very much of two schoolboys trying to stare each other out of countenance. Morale throughout the army had begun to sag considerably. At the north end of the rank and file of the Potomac Army, the men who did the fighting, and who had been under fire for three weeks, began to grow discouraged, Wilkeson wrote. The Confederates could sense it, too. The Yankees had lost all the boldness and dash which characterized their first movements, and are now proceeding with extreme caution, wrote one of Lee's officers. Ironically, Grant came to a similar conclusion about the Confederates. Lee's army is really whipped, he wrote to Washington. 
The prisoners we now take show it, and the action of his army shows it unmistakably. Grant based his assumption on the fact that Lee had refused to attack on May 24th, which the federal commander attributed to the weakened state of the Confederate army. He had no way to know the reason rested squarely on the weakened state of Lee alone. The rest of the Army of Northern Virginia, as it happened, remained in high spirits. They had once more fended off the larger, better-equipped Federal Army. This miscalculation on Grant's part would have grave repercussions in the days ahead. Leaving the Army of Northern Virginia ready to break, Grant would throw his full weight at them in a series of ill-advised attacks at Cold Harbor. Our success over Lee's army is already assured, he predicted, as he prepared to move in that direction. But Cold Harbor and its thousands of casualties lay in the future. As it was, federal soldiers saw the North Anna phase of the campaign as a disappointment at best and a failure at worst. How we longed to get away from the North Anna, Wilkerson wrote, where we had not one bit the slightest chance of success. Grant began to extract his army on May 26th. It was a delicate move to get the Army of the Potomac from its position south of the North Anna in the presence of the enemy, he said. He feinted westward and, with the help of Sheridan's cavalry, slipped eastward toward the Pamunkey River, under cover of the thick clouds that were scudding the sky. While Lee initially fell for the ruse, Confederate pickets, who made things lively for us with their whizzing, spattering bullets, said one Federal, still shattered the Army's cautious withdrawal. Before us, in the distance, rose the swells of Cold Harbor, Wilkeson wrote. And we marched steadily and joyfully to our doom. Appendix A THE BATTLE OF WILSON'S WHARF by Emanuel Dabney In April 1864, Major General Benjamin Butler prepared to begin operations against Richmond with his Army of the James. He did so in conjunction with the new strategy of Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant, who wanted to have simultaneous movements in Virginia by Major General George G. Meade's Army of the Potomac and Major General Franz Siegel's federal forces in the Shenandoah Valley. Additionally, Major General William T. Sherman's combined armies would move to destroy the Confederate Army of Tennessee and seize Atlanta, Georgia. Butler moved at daylight on May 5th. Two regiments of United States Colored Infantry occupied Wilson's Wharf in Charles City County, and another black regiment occupied Fort Powhatan in Prince George County. The rest of Brigadier General Edward Hink's Colored Division occupied City Point, modern-day Hopewell, Virginia, while white soldiers in the Army of the James landed at Bermuda Hundred, a peninsula of land in between Richmond and Petersburg. Soon after landing, the men of Butler's command began entrenching. While the United States Colored Troops fortified Wilson's Wharf in May 1864, William H. Clopton, a wealthy slaveholder in Charles City County, was informed that John C. Tyler, an elderly nephew of the deceased 10th president, was captured from Sherwood Forest, the home of the former president's family, then refugeeing in New York. Clopton went to see Brigadier General Edward Wilde, an avowed abolitionist and the commander of the brigade of black soldiers manning Wilson's Wharf and Fort Powhatan. Clopton arrived in camp, only to find that several of his former female slaves had preceded him. These women informed Wilde that Clopton was a most cruel master. Clopton was then treated to what enslaved people regularly encountered, a whipping. Sergeant George W. Hatton of the 1st USCI wrote to the Christian recorder that General Wilde ordered Mr. C. to be tied to a tree in front of headquarters where William Harris, a member of the regiment who used to belong to him, was called upon to undress him. 
Harris then called for the formerly enslaved women to come forward to witness, as he, in Hatton's words, gave Clopton 50 or 20 well-directed strokes. Harris then handed the women the whip. Their flogging brought the blood from Clopton's loins at every stroke. Another even more stunning encounter between black soldiers and a Charles City County planter occurred on Monday, May 16th. John L. Wilcox was at home when black soldiers descended upon his plantation and burned his house and outbuildings. Wilcox was in the yard of his destroyed property when he was ordered to march away with the black men in blue. He refused, and one of the soldiers turned to a white officer for direction. The officer replied, "'Shoot him,' whereupon one of the Negro guards fired and shot him through the head, below the left ear, and as he was falling, another fired and shot him through the right arm and side. Mr. W. died instantly. The whipping of a prominent white man and the murder of another prominent white man by armed black soldiers angered and unsettled people in Richmond, including President Jefferson Davis's military advisor, General Braxton Bragg. The two episodes had manifested their worst fears, that once black men were armed, they would be involved with a slave insurrection. Confederates needed a solution to these black soldiers, and that would fall upon the soldiers of Confederate General Robert E. Lee's nephew, Major General Fitzhugh Lee. While well, camped at Hanover Courthouse on May 23, 1864, the cavalry division commander received verbal orders from Bragg to surprise and capture the United States colored troops in garrison at Wilson's Wharf. At 4 p.m., Lee moved Wickham's, Lomax's, and Gordon's brigades, 800, 750, and 420 men respectively, with one piece of artillery for Kennan's place on the Lower James. This group also included the 5th South Carolina Cavalry under Colonel John Dunavant. At about 11 a.m. on May 24th, the Southern Cavalrymen were within sight of their objective. They drove in Federal pickets, but stopped short when they saw an earthen fort protected by strong abatis in front, and that it had a wide ditch and high walls. Lee dispatched a staff officer to order the garrison to surrender. John Gill, a courier on Fitzhugh Lee's staff, was the person sent to obtain the surrender. He was able to assess the strength of the fort much closer than his commander. When asked if the fort could be taken, Gill replied that it could not, and that any attack would prove disastrous. Confident behind his breastworks, General Wilde refused to surrender, saying he would try and hold it. According to Charles Price of the 2nd Virginia Cavalry, Wilde's men ran up a black flag. Often the reports of a real black flag during the Civil War are exaggerated, and thus it is impossible to know the veracity of this. Wilde and his soldiers had reason to be defiant. There was little need for a black flag to be displayed, as soldiers of African descent and the white officers who led them had little expectation to be treated like white federal prisoners of war. In November 1862, Confederate Secretary of War James A. Seddon wrote that "...slaves in flagrant rebellion are subject to death by the laws of every slaveholding state. They cannot be recognized in any way as soldiers subject to the rules of war and to trial by military courts." In May 1863, the Confederate Congress passed legislation that declared all white officers leading black soldiers shall be deemed as inciting servile insurrection, and if captured were to be put to death or be otherwise punished at the discretion of the court. Black soldiers, when captured in the Confederate States, were to be delivered to the authorities of the state in which they shall be captured, to be dealt with according to the present or future laws of such state or states. The laws were clear throughout the South that slave insurrectionists were to be killed immediately. The policies were employed by the Confederates at the Battle of Fort Pillow, Tennessee, on April 12, 1864, where soldiers under command of General Nathan Bedford Forrest attacked the fort's garrison consisting of white Tennessee Unionists and U.S. colored troops. 
After some rifle and artillery firing, Forrest demanded the fort surrender, which was refused. Confederates overwhelmed the defenders who fled down to the landing along the Mississippi River and received fire from their flank and rear. Federal troops threw up their arms and attempted to surrender. However, Confederate soldiers massacred the men, and their attention was particularly directed at the colored troops. Of the nearly 600 men in the garrison, only 58 black soldiers left as prisoners, as opposed to 168 of the white soldiers. Horrific stories were reported in newspapers, prompting the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, a congressional committee, to launch an investigation. Truth and rumors about Fort Pillow had provided additional rage in colored troop regiments, whose rank-and-file soldiers viewed the war as a means to prove their free status and gain citizenship. With Lee's cavalry division poised to strike Wilson's wharf, the soldiers on both sides knew the stakes. Fitzhugh Lee decided to continue his attack once Wilde rejected surrender. His plan was to use Colonel Donovan's South Carolinians and Lomax's Virginians in a diversionary assault on the Confederate right, while Wickham's brigade and the North Carolinians in the brigade headed by Colonel Clinton M. Andrew of the 2nd North Carolina Cavalry were massed for assault on the left. Wickham's and Andrew's men moved through the wooded terrain that concealed their movements for the strike on the eastern elevation of the fort. According to Paul Means of the 5th North Carolina Cavalry, the battle did not commence until 2.30 or 3 p.m. on May 24th. Chaplain Henry McNeil Turner of the 1st USCI noted that the rebel balls were flying like hail all around our heads but gallantly was the compliment returned. Andrew's Carolinians were on the far left of the attacking force, and just to their right were Wickham's troopers. The North Carolinians went in yelling and firing, but receiving fierce front and cross fires into our ranks from rifles and artillery in the fort and the gunboats. The artillery rounds from the USS Dawn, commanded by Lieutenant J.W. Simmons, forced the Confederates to stop firing upon the transport vessel Mayflower. Andrews, North Carolinians, and Wickham's Virginians continued dismounted, struggling through the abatee which entangled the men in their advance. They carried their sabers into battle, according to Charles Price, because they had orders to kill the last man in the fort if we had taken them. There were Negro troops as well as white in the fort. However, few Confederates reached the fort, and none used their sabers. A Confederate said the miniballs whizzed through our ranks, and the men in our lines tumbled over each other, some forward and some backward. Chaplain Turner was brief in his account of the battle. He summed up that the rebels were handsomely whipped. They fled before our men, carrying away a large number of their dead, and leaving a great many on their field for us to bury. Lee's troopers withdrew from the field and rejoined the cavalry divisions of Major General Wade Hampton and Fitzhugh's cousin, William H. F. Lee, to fight other battles in the ongoing spring campaign that fitted Fitzhugh's uncle against Ulysses S. Grant. Confederate casualty figures included 10 killed and 42 wounded and 4 missing in Wickham's brigade, while Colonel Donovan had 6 men wounded. For unknown reasons, casualty numbers were not reported for the North Carolinians or Lomax's Virginians. Once fired, bullets destroy and maim the bodies of the living, but also impact the family members left behind. A mini ball struck two Confederate brothers on the battlefield, Carrie Breckenridge, who was wounded, and Peachy Gilmer Breckenridge, who was killed. A different bullet had already taken the life of their brother, John, in 1862. Five days after the fight at Kennan's Landing, their sister Lucy scribbled in her diary that an uncle and another brother, James, informed the family that Gilmer had been wounded and captured. Worse still, Gilmer's body had been left on the battlefield. Their mother, Emma, immediately lost hope, and Lucy's sister Julia was completely broken-hearted and hopeless. On June 1st, the Breckenridges received a letter from James informing them that Gilmer was killed within 50 yards of the parapet. 
Julia laid about on June 2nd, unable to do anything. Lucy wrote succinctly and woefully, I cannot realize that I shall never see my noble, kind brother again. Federal casualties numbered around 28, including two men in the ship Mayflower. Of that number, six were killed. According to a Confederate officer, there were a few Negro prisoners from the picket line who were shot while attempting to escape. One prisoner who did not attempt to escape was brought away and sent to his master in Richmond. The Confederate failure to drive out the garrison at Wilson's Wharf could not come at a worse time, as Lee's army grappled with the Army of the Potomac, then only 28 miles away from Richmond. Thirty-seven years after the battle, private means still found it to be the most useless sacrifice of time and men and horses made during the war. Henry McNeil Turner, the USCT chaplain, however, found a more immediate and forceful lesson, that the federal government needed to provide equal pay to its black combatants. As he wrote to the Christian recorder, I would hear remark, and I do not care if Congress and the entire administration see the remark, that unless the colored troops get their full pay very soon, I tremble with fear for the issue of things. The tardiness of Congress in this matter has been watched by the colored soldiers with an undying eagerness, and every paper is ransacked with a view to their pay. But God grant that the evil may be speedily remedied is all I will now say. Wild's brigade's defenses of Wilson's Wharf gave steel to Turner's words. Appendix B The Battle of Milford Station by Daniel T. Davis A building belonging to a local whiskey distiller was the only structure attractive to the naked eye in Milford Station, an inconspicuous stop on the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad. It was far less famous than Guinea Station, several miles up the track, where Confederate General Stonewall Jackson had died in May 1863. The following spring, it would be thrust into the middle of the Overland Campaign as the scene of a dramatic event that it would influence the course of the fighting. Anxiety filled the night of May 21st, 1864, as the cavalrymen stood impatiently near the quiet country church at Massaponix. The troopers chatted among themselves, every now and again stealing glances up the road, straining to see any trace of the approaching column of foot soldiers that would signal the beginning of their march. Nearby, their commanding officer paced about the courtyard. For Brigadier General Alfred Torbert, this would be his first operation as a cavalry officer. Serving earlier in the war as an infantry commander, he was transferred to command of the 1st Division of the Cavalry Corps in April 1864. On the first day of the Battle of the Wilderness, Torbert was forced to step aside due to an abscess at the base of his spine and sent to Washington to recover. By the time of his return to the Army, Torbert was a scarce commodity. During the fighting at Spotsylvania Courthouse, Grant had dispatched the entire cavalry corps south to engage their enemy counterparts. In their absence, Torbert was given command of a hodgepodge brigade made up of men from Pennsylvania, New York, and Massachusetts. Being the only cavalry left with the army, Torbert's unit was chosen to lead the army's advance on a swing around the Confederate right flank. Torbert's assignment was to shield the infantry during their turning movement and secure the river crossings along the Mattapanai. Just after midnight, the Second Corps appeared in view. Saddling up, Torbert's men set out. Several hours of marching through the night brought the Union cavalry to Guinea Station. Elements of the Ninth Virginia Cavalry still ranged about the countryside. The 5th New York Cavalry, under the command of Colonel John Hammond, had the advance. Its chaplain remembered. Here, quite a force of the enemy made its appearance. Flankers were sent out, who boldly moved forward, entering the woods. Another road was found, which the fleeing rebels had taken. While this was being done, 
Companies A and B had been sent out to drive the rebels back and picket this road, and the column had passed on toward Bowling Green. The Yankee horsemen rode into this sleepy little town a couple hours ahead of Hancock's infantry. Torbert paused briefly for breakfast at the local hotel before setting out to the southwest toward Milford's station. Much to his surprise, rather than encountering the usual cavalry guards, Torbert ran into Confederate infantry. These Virginians belonged to a brigade commanded temporarily by Colonel William Terry. The old Dominion foot soldiers were veterans of the Army of Northern Virginia. Having participated in Pickett's charge at Gettysburg, Terry's men had been holding off Union forces south of Richmond when they were shipped north to reinforce Lee. Due to a shortage in train cars, only part of Terry's brigade was able to make the trip. Terry was waiting for the remainder of his force, along with the brigade of Brigadier General Montgomery Corse, before striking out for Spotsylvania. The Virginians were still in bivouac when Torbert's horsemen appeared, just opposite the station on the road from Bowling Green. Opting to take the offensive, Major George Norton ordered the 11th Virginia Infantry to attack the approaching Yankees, forcing a contingent of Torbert skirmishers from a nearby hillside. Irritated by the enemy offensive, Torbert decided to counterattack. Surging forward, troopers from the 1st and 16th Pennsylvania struck the Virginians. As the Confederate officers observed the action, they realized their opponents not only outnumbered them, but that more Union troopers were materializing. A decision was made to withdraw from their present position to the safety of the west bank of the Mattapanai. Unfortunately, some of the rebels did not receive the order until it was too late. In what one onlooker called a severe engagement, the Yankees overran the remaining rebel infantry, and the Union troopers swarmed about Milford Station. Despite the progress made during their march, as well as their success against Terry, neither Torbert nor Hancock were anxious to continue their offensive. Peering across the river, the Federal commanders could see Confederate infantry, the rest of Terry's men, and course, filing into line to reinforce their comrades. This delay would have far-reaching consequences. It was not long before Hancock's movement was reported to Lee at Spotsylvania. Fearing that Grant was beginning a general movement, Lee began shifting his infantry and sent the cavalry division of Major General Wade Hampton to bolster Terry and course and keep an eye on the Yankees. The following morning found Lee well on his way to the North Anna, and by midday his men arrived well ahead of the Federals. Meanwhile, May 22nd found Hancock still situated in the same place he had occupied the day before. Perhaps his old wound suffered at Gettysburg was nagging him, but the normally aggressive Hancock held back. His corps, supported by Torbert, could have easily swept aside the combined forces of Hampton, Terry, and Corse. Such an action would have opened the way to the Telegraph Road, and more importantly, Hancock would have been well ensconced in the enemy's rear and ready to pin Lee in place between his men and the remainder of the Union Army coming down from the north. But as quickly as the opportunity presented itself, it faded. The potential of striking a decisive blow to the Army of Northern Virginia, one that Grant had hoped for when he began the movement away from Spotsylvania, was just out of reach. The stand of Terry and then Corse and Hampton ensured the safety of Lee's army as it marched to the North Anna. Appendix C. The Eye of the Storm. Grant and Meade. By Chris Mikowski. In the photograph, Ulysses S. Grant stands behind a bench back to the camera, leaning over the shoulder of his top subordinate, George Gordon Meade. Neither of their faces are visible, but I imagine the strain of the last two weeks wears on them like threadbare blankets. It's May 21st, 1864, and the Federal Army has marched, fought, and maneuvered non-stop since the 3rd. It's marching again, even now, as Grant tries to lure the Confederates out of their entrenchments at Spotsylvania 
and block them from, or beat them to, the strong position at the North Anna River. They've stopped here, at the intersection in front of Massaponic's church, to study the maps. The commanders are exhausted. Yet Grant hasn't stopped, not really, not long enough for the photographer to catch him still for a picture anyway. Captured in the act of leaning over, part of him is literally a blur. Part of him is solid enough to block Meade almost entirely from view. Leadership became so blurred, in fact, that one observer described the Army of the Potomac as directed by Grant, commanded by Meade, and led by Hancock, Sedgwick, and Warren. Meade, frustrated, said the description about hits the nail on the head. As with everything else in this campaign of attrition, the relationship between these two men has eroded, and the good first impression Meade had of Grant has become a casualty. Grant is so much more active than his predecessor, and agrees so well with me in his views, I cannot but be rejoiced at his arrival. Meade had written to his wife in April, shortly after meeting his new boss. My duty is plain, to continue quietly to discharge my duties, heartily cooperating with him and under him. Grant had intended to let Meade run the show, while he merely tagged along to offer strategic direction and personal incentive. But hands-off command did not suit Grant. As the Overland campaign unfurled, he took an increasing role in daily tactical operations, and that took an increasing toll on his relations with Meade. It's hard to know if Grant understood the stormy effects of his presence, or, if he did, whether he cared. It's equally hard to know if Grant realized, or cared, that he was sending mixed messages. Meade has more than met my most sanguine expectations, Grant told the War Department on May 13th while urging Meade's promotion. He and Sherman are the fittest officers for large commands I have come in contact with. Yet days earlier, Grant had taken Phil Sheridan's part over Meade when the cavalrymen exploded insubordinately, thus undercutting Meade's authority. Days later at North Anna, though, Grant bolstered Meade's authority by placing the Ninth Corps under Meade's overall command. I wonder what it must have been like for poor Meade to have his boss hanging over his shoulder all the time. The photo from the church depicts the metaphor graphically. Grant quite literally eclipses Meade just by being there in the picture, there with the army. If there was any honorable way of retiring from my present false position, I would undoubtedly adopt it, Meade wrote in a letter to his wife on May 19th, just two days prior to the stop at Massaponic's church. But there is none, and all I can do is patiently submit and bear with resignation the humiliation. He found himself trapped by the same duty that had, just a month earlier, seemed so plain to him. The benches in the photo are pews pulled out of the church so Grant's men could get some rest on the march and so Grant could consult with them. Most of the faces in the photo are turned away. Others are blurry, men with faces so busy they're caught in motion. Some, caught in mid-movement, look like transparent specters only half there. They are ghosts haunting the photo. One man, though, toward the right of the photo, has his left elbow perched on the back of his pew, and he has turned around over his left shoulder to face the photographer. He's looking right at the camera, face clear and knowing. I see you, he says, and I know what you're up to. Watch and you'll see something unfold that you could not have ever possibly imagined. I've driven by the church and the parking lot where the photo was taken a hundred times. I've never been inside, however, never seen the parking lot from the angle where the photo was taken. Photographer Timothy O'Sullivan, traveling with the army, had climbed into the second story, lugging all his gear, and shot from on high the photo of the Council of War held on church pews. He managed to grab four photographs during his stop at Massaponics. 
A copy of one of those photos hangs in my office. I wonder how far that image has traveled over time and distance to end up on a cinder block wall in western New York. The image has become one of the most iconic of the war. On the surface, it shows hustle and bustle and exhaustion and dust, horses and wagons and mules and men. But it is also the picture of Meade's frustration, married to his devotion to duty. Most of all, it's a picture of a hurricane. That circle of pews is its eye. Tremendous kinetic frenzy swirls all around its edge. It is Hurricane Grant, and Meade is caught up in it like everyone else. Appendix D, Lee's Engineer, Martin Luther Smith, by Rob Orison. By 1864, warfare had evolved. Both sides became proficient at killing one another and building fortifications and earthworks to better their defense. The landscape between Fredericksburg and Petersburg would be scarred with hundreds of miles of earthworks. One of the masterminds of engineering trench warfare was Martin Luther Smith. History buffs can only name a handful of personalities from the Civil War that seem present at many important events. One man who finds himself involved in widespread actions is Confederate engineer Martin L. Smith. Smith played a crucial role in both the Western and Eastern theaters and served in a vital role for the Army of Northern Virginia in the spring of 1864. A native New Yorker, Smith graduated West Point in 1842, before military duties took him south. While stationed in Florida, Smith married a native Georgian. During the Mexican War, Smith received a brevet promotion for his services in helping Winfield Scott as an engineer. Smith oversaw the mapping of the valley around Mexico City, proving vital for Scott's campaign against the Mexican capital in the fall of 1847. At the time of the secession crisis, Smith chose to follow his adopted home and cast his fortunes with the Confederacy. On April 1, 1861, he resigned his commission and was commissioned by the Confederacy as a major of engineers. Though Smith's background was as an engineer, he found himself serving in the infantry as a brigade commander in New Orleans. However, Smith managed to find the time to assist in planning out the defenses of the city, and there he began to show his prowess for identifying and overseeing construction of defensive works. Smith was soon transferred to the Confederate Engineer Corps as a brigadier general. He oversaw the defensive works around the vital city of Vicksburg while serving as a garrison commander of the city, and he helped repulse Union forces at the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou. During the final Vicksburg campaign, Smith led an infantry division in Lieutenant General John Pemberton's army. With the surrender of the city, Smith's parole effectively took him out of the war for seven months. After Smith was exchanged in February 1864, he reported to Richmond and became the chief engineer to the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee required good engineers to assist in thwarting Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant's summer campaign. Arriving in Orange, Virginia, in April 1864, Smith began to excel at his new post. He proved his skills as an engineer on May 6, 1864, at the Wilderness. As Lieutenant General James Longstreet's corps' counterattack began to stall in the morning, Smith scouted out a way around the Union left. Longstreet considered Smith a splendid tactician, as well as skillful engineer and gallant withal. Shortly, Smith returned to Lee and Longstreet and informed them of an unfinished railroad cut that could lead an attacking force around the Union left. With Smith's help, Longstreet was able to send four brigades along the route and roll up the Union left. Smith continued to assist Lee and also played a pivotal role in developing many lines around Spotsylvania, including the Mule Shoe Salient. Arguably, Smith's finest performance may have been on the banks of the North Anna River on May 23, 1864. As Lee improperly guessed the Union Army's intentions, Grant was able to cross three corps south of the North Anna. Easily flanked in his current position, Lee called the staff meeting at Hanover Junction and discussed options. 
One was to pull back to the South Anna River, but this gave up the very important railroad intersection at Hanover Junction. As his second option, Lee considered using the Virginia Central Railroad as a defensive embankment, but this opened his left flank for an attack. His final option involved the possible shift eastward to the Totopotomy or Pamunkey Rivers, Grant's expected next target. This gave up the railroad junction, though, and drew the fighting closer to Richmond. Another option was available, and Smith proposed turning a bad situation into a great tactical opportunity. Smith suggested creating a new defensive line that formed an inverted V, using strong geography to the Confederates' advantage. By using internal lines, Lee could reinforce either side of the V easily. The Confederate position divided the two wings of the Union Army and placed the North Anna River between them and reinforcements from the other wing. Lee's army could easily leave a small force behind to hold one line while the bulk of his force crushed one of the Union wings that crossed the river. With the assistance of famous Confederate mapmaker Jedediah Hotchkiss, Smith laid out the new defensive Confederate line, and earthworks were soon being thrown up. It was an innovative idea, and one that the commanding general wholeheartedly agreed to. By the morning of May 24th, the Confederate lines were redrawn, and Grant walked into Lee's trap. Unfortunately for the Confederates, Lee lay prone in his tent due to sickness, and the attack never took place. Grant eventually realized his folly and withdrew to the north bank of the North Anna. Smith remained with the Army of Northern Virginia until July, when he was transferred to the Army of Tennessee, where he served Confederate Lieutenant General John Bell Hood in the same capacity he had with Lee. After the reckless Tennessee campaign, Smith was again transferred to Mobile, Alabama, as a departmental engineer. He oversaw the improvement of the defenses of Mobile, although the port was virtually closed in the summer of 1864 by the capture of the Mobile Bay forts by Admiral David Farragut. When the city fell in April 1865, Smith returned home and surrendered in May. Smith passed away on July 29, 1866, in Rome, Georgia, at a young age of 46. The New York Times reported that he was attacked by an inflammation of the bowels and was buried in Athens, Georgia. Martin L. Smith remains a mystery for historians. He was a man who was intimately involved in so many important actions of the Civil War, yet he is not the focus of any biography or major work. Sources are scarce, though a limited diary exists and provides some details into his day-to-day -day life during the later years of the war. The man considered by many as the most accomplished engineer in the Confederacy is today only remembered by a bust at Vicksburg National Military Park and a small case containing his uniform in the Museum of the Confederacy, a legacy lost to history. Appendix E. Preserving North Anna, A Personal Battlefield Journey by John F. Cummings III. Editor's Note. Most Civil War enthusiasts have their one particularly special battlefield, for Spotsylvania County historian John Cummings, his connection to the North Anna battlefield dates back to childhood, and he has been entwined with various preservation, interpretation, and commemoration efforts ever since. As John's story demonstrates, Civil War preservation today is often the story of people who love those landscapes. The young don't realize it, but eventually the old adage, time flies, becomes a rude truism. As a teenager in the 1970s, I was introduced to the North Anna battlefield by a Richmond area resident, Ron Pizzini. My father and I would travel south from our Fairfax County home on numerous occasions to join Ron on relic hunting trips, always on private property and with permission. On one particular Saturday, Ron directed us to a large parcel just inside the Hanover County line. The property was across the road from a quarry operation. The road ran alongside the Virginia Central, a rail line that figures as prominently today in the Commonwealth's commerce as it did in 1864 when it ran supplies from the Shenandoah Valley to the beleaguered southern forces above Richmond. 
We turned into a narrow farm lane that cut across a short field and entered a wood line that bordered a swamp. A little ways on, the woods opened up again, and we entered a large rectangular field that had a dog leg, bordered again by woods, and a far lesser trail that continued into the darkness. On the edge of that trail, we parked our cars and looked across the large field where the owners of the day had a primitive horse racing track. Ron told us about this place we had just come to. At that time, the most popular, albeit brief, treatment on the subject was little more than two pages long in Freeman's Lee's Lieutenants. The fighting on the North Anna was barely more than a footnote in most studies of the war, even in a primary source like Confederate General Evander M. Law's presentation of the Overland Campaign in Battles and Leaders. This action presented the last tangible what-if of the war that armchair historians could grasp. Here had presented itself the real possibility that Lee could have wrecked Grant's army. But it was not in the cards, with Lee sidelined by illness and stymied by his lack of a capable lieutenant to carry out the necessary moves. The way Ron presented our day's plan to us, we could either cut across the big field and into the woods where we would eventually encounter the left wing of Lee's inverted V trench line, or go down the narrow trail, which led to the advanced rifle pits of Mahomes sharpshooters. Either way, we would find abundant historical features. Just past the trenches of the V was Oxford Road, long abandoned as a major thoroughfare, but still quite distinct. Following it northeast, we eventually came to the ford itself, commanded on the south side by a steep bluff upon which stood the apex of the Confederate defenses. The face of the bluff had received heavy pounding by the Federal Ninth Corps artillery, and abundant iron fragments remained beneath the surface to attest to that ferocity. Exploring the battlefield of North Anna became one of the highlights of my childhood, and I would enjoy numerous return trips over the next couple years. But as time marched on and I graduated from high school in 1979, other more traditional interests occupied my time. Thankfully, by 1992, I was a bit more grounded, and with a reaffirming of my love of history came a renewed interest in the North Anna. By then, I had come across the single-volume examination of the battle by J. Michael Miller, even to hell itself, which finally dug deep into the engagement. It was around this time that I found, much to my pleasure, that there was talk of creating an actual battlefield park at North Anna, an opportunity that had been missed by the National Park Service in the 1930s. I found that historian Mike Miller lived near me at the time in northern Virginia, and we became friends with our mutual interest in this battlefield. He had been brought in as an advisor to the quarry company, General Crushed Stone. They had acquired the inverted V side of Route 684 and desired to expand their operations in that direction. As a concession to concerns of local residents and historical organizations, they offered to create an interpretive trail system, preserving 74 acres of battleground, including most of the western leg of the V. I also met Around that time, Ron Richards, a school teacher from Manassas who was authoring an alternative history trilogy. The first volume, A Southern Yarn, featured the fight along the North Anna, utilizing Lee's advantages there to create a reversal of Southern fortunes, ending the war with a Confederate victory and the capture of President Lincoln. I offered the quarry and county officials my services and the assistance of other associates to help facilitate the creation of the park and provide future living history demonstrations. Through Mike Miller, we also met military artist Donna Neary, who was commissioned to produce the official painting for the park by General Crushed Stone. Four of us did the modeling for all of the figures in Donna's painting, which depicted the ill-fated advance of the 57th Massachusetts Infantry, against Mississippians commanded by Colonel M. B. Harris. As the opening of the park neared, James Izell, a geologist subcontracted by General Crushed Stone, worked with me to design and build a demonstration trench near the trailhead of the park, just off the parking lot. This was intended to provide a place where reenactors could show the public how the real works were constructed and used by soldiers, 
without damage to the actual cultural resources further down the trail. Unfortunately, the reconstructed trenches are one of the first things visitors encounter in the park, and now, more than 25 years later, there has yet to be installed the sign that explains that they are not indeed the real McCoy. On the weekend of October 2nd and 3rd, 1992, Hanover County and General Crushed Stone held the official opening of the park, and enthusiastic crowds, led by Mike Miller, toured the trail. At that point, and for some time later, the park was a limited-access facility, requiring visitors to first obtain a key from the county parks and rec department. The initial reasoning for this was fear that blasting by the neighboring quarry might send large rocks showering onto park grounds. After a while, and much to the relief of everyone concerned, the precaution was found to be an overreaction, and the gate is now open at all times during daylight hours. On May 22nd, 23rd, 1993, Hanover County hosted a battle anniversary open house at the park, where I once again coordinated living history demonstrations and personally led tours of the trail system. The following year... General Crushed Stone and Hanover County hosted the 130th Anniversary Commemorative Battle Reenactment on a quarry property adjacent to the park. I was the reenactor coordinator for the event and provided a section of recreated earthworks to help portray the 57th Massachusetts's advance. For me, what brought everything home was that the event was held in the same field where, many years before, my father and I had parked with Ron Pizzini to go explore this great site. In the years since, the park has more than doubled in size, largely due to the generosity of the quarry that operates alongside it. Additional lands related to the battle have also been preserved outside of the Hanover County Park, chiefly the Jericho Mill site acquired by the American Battlefield Trust in 2014. Other related sites remain unprotected. Sadly, perhaps more so to me than anyone else, that large field with the dogleg and the racetrack is disappearing into the expansion of the quarry operation, part of the trade-off that allows preservation to work with modern industry. Along with it, I fear, will be the rifle pits of Mahone's men. Some privately held parcels continue to enjoy the protection of conscientious landowners, such as the location of Hennigan's Redoubt along the old Telegraph Road Trace. Not easily accessible, but nonetheless preserved for the most part by the virtue of its remoteness, is the location of the pontoon and footbridges where Union troops were photographed by Timothy O'Sullivan bathing in the North Anna River. The eastern leg of the V, too, amazingly survives today with little intrusion, there is hope that part, if not all, may someday enjoy protection and deserved interpretation. We have now passed the conclusion of the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. Ron Pazzini and my father are both gone now, and I'm four years into my second century. Time does fly, and we don't see it coming. But when it's gone, it's history. That's for certain. Appendix F Preserving North Anna, The Art of the Battle, by Chris Mikowski. In the gallery's worth of Civil War art now on the market, only one artist has chosen to depict a moment from the Battle of North Anna. Donna Neary's Even to Hell Itself, painted in 1992, depicts the climax of the fight at Ox Ford late in the afternoon of May 24, 1864. The Federals are just about to be overrun by several Confederate units that are coming at them over the tops of their earthworks, Neary says. In the midst of a pounding thunderstorm, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Chandler of the 54th Massachusetts tries to rally his men. Some are running, the rain is coming down, it's a bad situation. As dramatic as the moment is, the choice of topics seems unconventional. Most painters choose their subjects because of the potential commercial value, yet even to hell itself does not depict one of the war's popular major battles or famous people. I like doing things no one else has done, Neary explains. North Anna is not one of the hot popular battles. It's not Gettysburg. It's not Fredericksburg. 
For Neary, the project offered a chance to show a story that had largely been overlooked. Historian J. Michael Miller was helping General Crushed Stone, a local gravel company, to develop the north end of Battlefield Park, which was on land owned by the gravel company. Miller approached Neary about getting involved. He said, Nobody's done North Anna before, so I said, Okay, talk me into it. Miller did, and the gravel company commissioned Neary to create a painting that could be reproduced and displayed as part of an exhibit for visitors. Because the land the company was donating for the park contained the earthworks of Lee's inverted V line, the company wanted Neary's painting to depict some sort of action near the earthworks. I read and read and read and read, Neary says. Mike suggested that Colonel Chandler rallying his men below the earthworks would be a good subject, and I agreed. Miller, along with several other researchers, provided most of the material, and Neary read numerous histories on the subject, including diaries, many of them unpublished. You spend a lot of time reading, Neary says. Pretty soon, an image begins to develop in your mind. You keep eliminating and adding things until you come up with an image that sticks with you. Extensive research was needed so that Neary could depict the scene as accurately as possible. A writer can write something like, They wore blue coats and green hats and get away with it. I need to know, was it light blue? Dark blue? How was the coat cut? What did the buttons look like? As with many of my paintings, I even had to research the direction the wind was blowing at the time. The gravel company bought the rights to reproduce Neary's painting on the sign that greets visitors in the battlefield parking lot. It has also since appeared on the cover of Gordon Ray's book To the North Anna River, and it has been sold as a limited edition print. The original painting hangs on her living room wall in a massive heavy frame, she says. Neary has since moved from the genre of Civil War arts, painting now mostly for pleasure in her Shenandoah Valley studio. The room is open and high, with tall windows that let in plenty of natural light. It makes the work tricky. As the sun slides over the valley, it shifts the room's shadows and affects the brightness. I tend to paint dark, she says, referring to the palette of colors and tones she draws from. A lamp over her easel helps keep the light quality consistent as she works, and she can pull down room-darkening blinds to further insulate herself. It's hard sometimes because the vista outside is gorgeous. Still, after two and a half decades, the moment she chose from the North Anna battlefield sticks with her for its poignancy. It's sad the way it all occurred, the way Brigadier General James Ledley attacked against orders, she says of the federal assaults. It's not a battle where someone did something fantastic that's been remembered ever since, she adds. But for one brief moment in time that now lasts forever in oil on canvas, Chandler remains on his feet. He's not yet gone down. His men have not yet completely broken. His brave rally continues. Thanks to Neary, people pay heed and remember. Thank you for listening to this audio presentation of Strike Them a Blow, Battle Along the North Anna. May 21st through the 25th, 1864, by Chris Mikowski, read for you by the author. Text copyright 2013-2020, production copyright 2020. You can find more titles in the Emerging Civil War series online at the publisher's website, www.savisbeatty.com, or on the Emerging Civil War site, www.emergingcivilwar.com. Dot com.